Story 1 It all began as a quest for solitude, a break from the relentless noise of city life. I had always craved adventure, the kind that only untamed wilderness could provide. So when I found myself with a week to spare, I packed my gear and headed to Big Bend National Park, a sprawling expanse of desert, mountains and rivers in Texas. Little did I know, this trip would test the very limits of my resolve. The first day was everything I had hoped for. The vast landscape stretched endlessly, with rugged cliffs and the Rio Grande carving its way through the park. As an experienced hiker, I was confident in my abilities, perhaps overly so. Entranced by the beauty around me, I ventured off the main trail, eager to discover what lay beyond the beaten path. This decision, made on a whim, would soon turn my adventure into a nightmare. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of orange and pink, a chilling realization set in I was hopelessly lost. The trail I had left behind was nowhere to be seen and in its place, a labyrinth of rocks and cacti extended in all directions. My phone, which I had foolishly relied upon, was nothing more than a useless brick, its signal lost among the vast expanse of wilderness. Nightfall in Big Bend is swift and absolute. The park, known for its dark skies, offered no comfort as the stars emerged, their light too faint to guide me. I had no choice but to seek shelter under a rock overhang, a meager protection against the elements. The temperatures plummeted, and I huddled in my sleeping bag, trying to conserve every bit of warmth. The sounds of the night were terrifying. Every rustle, every snap of a twig, sent my heart racing. I was acutely aware of my vulnerability, a lone human in a park teeming with wildlife. The howls of coyotes echoed in the distance, a stark reminder that I was not alone. My imagination ran wild with thoughts of mountain lions and rattlesnakes, each noise conjuring images of creatures lurking just beyond sight. As the hours crawled by, my mind became my own worst enemy. Isolation and fear took hold, wrapping their icy fingers around my thoughts. I replayed the day's decisions, each one a link in the chain that had led me here. Regret mingled with fear, a potent mix that made sleep an impossible dream. The night seemed endless, but eventually the first light of dawn broke the darkness. Exhausted and shaken, I emerged from my makeshift shelter, determined to find my way back. But the park, so inviting under the sunlight, was a different beast now. Every direction looked the same, a maze of desert and stone with no clear way out. I walked for hours, my sense of direction faltering with each passing mile. Thirst began to gnaw at me, my water supply dangerously low. The sun, once a welcomed friend, became a harsh adversary, beating down mercilessly. Desperation set in, each step driven by the sheer will to survive. Miraculously, late into the afternoon I stumbled upon a trail marker, a beacon of hope in my darkest hour. With the last ounces of my strength I followed it, each step fueled by the thought of rescue. Eventually I emerged onto the main trail, where a park ranger found me, dehydrated and sunburnt, but alive. Looking back, my ordeal in Big Bend National Park was a humbling experience. It taught me respect for nature's power and its indifference to human presence. I had ventured into the wilderness seeking solitude, and I found it, but not in the way I had imagined. The park had stripped me of my arrogance, leaving a profound appreciation for the fragility of life and the strength we possess to endure against the odds. Story 2 The trip to Marfa had been a spontaneous decision, driven by stories of its ethereal beauty and the mysterious lights that danced on the horizon. The small Texan town and oasis of art and culture in the vast desert had always intrigued me. After a weekend immersed in its unique charm, I set off back home, eager to beat the Sunday evening traffic. That's when I decided to take a shortcut, a decision that would lead me into the heart of the unknown. The road I chose was marked on an old, worn-out map I'd found in a local coffee shop. It promised a direct route through the desert, cutting hours off my journey. As I turned onto the dirt track, the last rays of the sun dipped below the horizon, leaving a canvas of stars above. The road was rough, more a path than a road, winding through the desolate, moonlit landscape. Miles from anywhere, my car sputtered and died, as sudden as a candle snuffed out by the wind. The dashboard went dark, the engine silent. Panic surged as I turned the key again and again, hoping for a miracle that didn't come. Stranded, alone, with only the vast Texas desert for company, 
I felt a chill that had nothing to do with the night air. Then in the rearview mirror, salvation appeared in the form of headlights. They cut through the darkness, approaching fast. Relief washed over me, quickly replaced by confusion. There was no sound, no roar of an engine to accompany the lights. With a sense of urgency, I opened the car door and stepped out, waving my arms, desperate to catch the driver's attention. But as the lights drew near, a profound silence enveloped me, the kind that presses in on your ears. Then, inexplicably, just as hope sparked, the headlights vanished, not dimmed or turned away, but disappeared as if they had never been. The darkness returned, absolute, leaving me alone with the night and its secrets. The logical part of my brain scrambled for explanations, a trick of the light, a reflection. But deep down, a primal fear took root, the fear of the unknown, the unseen. I was reminded of the Marfa lights, the unexplained phenomena that it had drawn me to this place. Was this another mystery of the desert or something more sinister? I retreated to my car, locking the doors out of instinct. The desert, once a place of beauty and wonder, had transformed into a landscape of shadows and whispers. Every sound seemed amplified in the silence, the rustle of the wind through the scrub, the distant cry of a night bird. Hours passed, each one in eternity. I debated my options, but leaving the car seemed a risk too great. My phone, predictably, had no signal, a useless lifeline in my hand. As the night stretched on, my mind raced with possibilities. Stories I'd heard in Marfa, tales of lost travelers and ghostly apparitions, circled in my thoughts, blurring the lines between reality and myth. Dawn broke with a subtlety, the sky lightening by degrees. The desert, so menacing in the dark, regained its stark beauty under the rising sun. The road ahead, however, remained deserted, the promise of rescue as distant as ever. In the light of day, I gathered my courage and set off on foot, determined to find help. The desert, alive with the sounds of the morning, seemed less threatening. Birds called from the brush, and small creatures rustled in the underbrush. Yet the memory of the vanishing light stayed with me, a shadow at the edge of my thoughts. After what felt like miles, a real set of headlights appeared on the horizon, this time accompanied by the sound of an engine, a sound more beautiful than any melody. The truck that pulled up was driven by a local rancher, his face marked by the sun and wind, a lifeline in human form. He listened to my story with a quiet intensity, nodding as if it confirmed something he already knew. Strange things happen in the desert, he said, finally. You're not the first to see those lights and you won't be the last. Some say it's spirits, others, aliens. But out here, we've learned to live with the mysteries. He towed my car to the nearest town, a silent guardian angel in a battered hat. As I watched the desert recede in the rearview mirror, I couldn't help but feel changed. The experience had left its mark, a story to be told and retold, a reminder of the night I was left alone, or perhaps not alone, on a back road near Marfa. Story 3 the morning started like any other, with the familiar hustle of city life filtering through my window. The weather forecast had mentioned heavy rain, a common occurrence in Houston, but nothing had prepared me for what was to come. As the day progressed, the rain intensified, a relentless deluge that seemed to drown the world in shades of gray. By mid-afternoon, it became apparent that this was no ordinary storm. The streets below my second floor apartment transformed into rivers, the water rising at an alarming rate. Cars, once stationary, began to drift past my window, eerie ships navigating a concrete sea. The power flickered and then went out, plunging my world into darkness, save for the occasional flash of lightning that illuminated the chaos outside. Isolated in my apartment, the sounds of the storm became my constant companion. The water, once a mere inconvenience, now roared with a life of its own, a relentless force that reshaped everything in its path. Amidst this cacophony, human voices pierced the night, cries for help that went unanswered, each one a stark reminder of the devastation unfolding just beyond my reach. As night fell, the reality of my situation set in. Trapped, with no electricity and dwindling supplies, I was forced to confront the possibility that rescue might not come in time. The floodwaters showed no signs of receding, each hour bringing them closer to my doorstep. I retreated from the windows, afraid of what I might see, or worse, what might see me. The first night was the longest of my life. 
I lay in darkness, listening to the sound of my own breathing, punctuated by the distant cries for help. Sleep was an elusive dream, chased away by the fear of what the morning light would reveal. In those hours I found myself grappling with a sense of helplessness, a feeling that I was but a small piece of a larger, indifferent universe. Morning brought no relief, only the stark reality of my situation. The water had risen further, and now the street where I had walked just days before was completely submerged. The sight was surreal, a familiar landscape transformed into something alien and threatening. The cars that had floated past were now trapped, half-submerged relics of a world that seemed increasingly distant. The second day passed in a blur, time measured not by the clock but by the shifting light that filtered through the clouds. My phone, my only link to the outside world, was now a lifeline running on borrowed time. Desperate messages sent to family and friends, pleas for help that I feared might never be answered. It was in this despair that I found a reservoir of strength I did not know I possessed. Faced with the prospect of waiting for a rescue that might not come, I began to prepare for the worst. I rationed my food and water, conserving every precious resource. I filled bottles and containers with water from the taps, afraid that even this might soon be taken from me. On the third day, a sound different from the storm caught my attention. At first I dared not hope, but then it grew louder, a distinct thrumming that cut through the rain. Rescue helicopters, their presence a beacon of hope in the dreary sky. My heart soared with relief tears mixing with the rain on my face as I signaled from my window, a solitary figure reaching out for salvation. The rescue was nothing short of miraculous, a testament to human will and determination. As I was lifted above the floodwaters, the scale of the disaster became apparent. Entire neighborhoods were submerged, the city I called home unrecognizable beneath the deluge. In that moment, suspended between earth and sky, I understood the fragility of our existence the thin line between normalcy and catastrophe. The days that followed were a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. Communities came together, strangers became friends, and the city began the slow process of healing. My own rescue, while personal, was just one of many stories of survival and perseverance. Reflecting on my experience, I am reminded of the power of nature and the importance of preparedness and community. The floodwaters may have receded, but the memories remain a reminder of the brief moment when the world turned upside down. It was a test of endurance, of the ability to face the unknown with hope and courage. Story 4 The ad in the local Dallas paper had promised easy money, a security guard position for an abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. Night shift, low stress at red, just walk the perimeter and check the doors. Desperate for work, I didn't think twice before calling the number listed. That decision would lead me down a path of discovery and fear, into the heart of a mystery that was anything but mundane. But my first night on the job, the factory loomed like a forgotten monument to industry, its silent chimneys piercing the night sky. The perimeter check was straightforward enough, a simple routine of locked gates and rusted padlocks that spoke of years of disuse. Yet, as I made my rounds, a sound halted me in my tracks, the unmistakable hum of machinery in operation, vibrating through the cool night air. Rationalizing it as a trick of the mind, the product of isolation and the eerie setting, I continued my patrol. Yet, each night, the sound returned, more insistent, a phantom symphony of gears and pistons that should not have been. Curiosity, mingled with an undeniable sense of duty, pushed me to investigate. The factory, abandoned for decades, held secrets in its shadowed halls, and I felt compelled to uncover them. Armed with a flashlight and a heavy sense of apprehension, I ventured inside on my fourth night. The door, surprisingly, gave way with little resistance, as if inviting me into its depths. The sound guided me, leading me through dark, dust-choked corridors filled with the detritus of a bygone era. The air was thick with the smell of oil and metal, a tangible reminder of the factory's industrial past. As I delved deeper, the machinery's drone grew louder, an omnipresent roar that seemed to emanate from the very walls. It was impossible, I told myself. The power had been cut off years ago, the machinery long since silenced. And yet the sound persisted, a challenge to my senses and my sanity. The source, when I found it, made my blood run cold. 
In a vast, cavernous room at the factory's heart, the machinery was indeed running, but not as I had expected. Before me stood a contraption of indeterminate purpose, its components whirring and spinning with frenetic energy. But it was not electricity that powered this device around it. Dozens of shadows moved, spectral figures bound to the machine, their ethereal hands working the controls. I stood, frozen, as the realization dawned on me. The factory, abandoned by the living, had been claimed by the dead. These spirits, trapped in an endless cycle of labor, were the source of the machinery's impossible activity. Their faces, etched with the weariness of unending toil, turned towards me, eyes pleading for release from their spectral bondage. Panic surged through me, a primal urge to flee from the nightmare before my eyes. Yet amidst the fear, a spark of compassion ignited. These souls, ensnared by forces unknown, called out for salvation, and I, the unwitting witness to their plight, could not turn away. The nights that followed were a blur of research and desperate planning. By day, I scoured local archives and libraries, piecing together the factory's tragic history. A catastrophic accident, decades ago, had claimed the lives of countless workers, their spirits tethered to the site of their untimely demise. The machinery, it seemed, was the key to their entrapment, a focal point for the energy that bound them to this earthly plane. Armed with this knowledge, I returned to the factory, determined to break the cycle. The solution, as it turned out, was deceptively simple. In the dead of night, under a waxing moon, I shut down the machine, a task that required no small amount of courage and a willing suspension of disbelief. As the last gear ground to a halt, a profound silence filled the room, a silence complete and absolute. In the moments that followed, the factory transformed before my eyes, the shadows, once tethered to the machine, lifted, their forms dissolving into the ether with sighs of relief and gratitude. The air lightened, the oppressive weight of sorrow lifting in an instant, leaving behind a sense of peace and closure. As dawn broke over the abandoned factory, I walked its halls one last time. The building, once a prison for the restless dead, now stood empty, a silent monument to the past. My job here was done the spirits released from their earthly toil. Reflecting on my experience, I was struck by the realization that the world is far more complex and mysterious than we can imagine. The factory, with its phantoms and secrets, had taught me that behind every shadow there might lie a story, a whisper of the past reaching out for understanding and compassion. Story 5 The painy woods of East Texas, with their towering trees and dense underbrush, had always been a place of solace for me. A place where I could escape the relentless pace of city life and find peace in the solitude of nature. So when the opportunity arose for a weekend camping trip, I grabbed my gear, my faithful dog, Ranger, and headed into the heart of this vast wilderness. The first day was everything I hoped it would be. The forest welcomed us with open arms, its canopy of leaves filtering the sunlight into patterns of gold and green. Ranger, Ever the explorer, darted ahead, his barks echoing through the trees, a sound of pure joy and freedom. As evening approached, we found a clearing, a perfect spot to set up camp. The fire crackled to life, casting a warm glow against the encroaching darkness of the woods. It was here, in this idyllic setting, that the first threads of unease began to weave their way into my consciousness. It started with a feeling, an instinctive sense that we were not alone. I told myself it was nothing, just the natural paranoia that comes with the isolation of the wilderness, but Ranger felt it too. His playful demeanor changed as the night deepened he became alert, his ears perking up at the slightest sound, his body tense and ready. Then it happened. A low growl rumbled in his throat, a sound I had never heard him make before. It was a warning, primal and clear. Something, or someone, was out there, just beyond the reach of the firelight. Grabbing a flashlight, I ventured a few cautious steps into the darkness, the beam cutting through the night. But there was nothing, only the trees and the shadows they cast, moving gently in the breeze. The feeling of being watched, however, did not abate. It clung to me, a cold hand on the back of my neck. I retreated to the safety of the fire, convincing myself that it was just the woods playing tricks on my mind. Ranger, though, remained vigilant 
his eyes fixed on the unseen presence that lurked in the darkness. Morning couldn't come soon enough. The night was restless, filled with half-sleep and jarring awakenings to every crack and rustle in the underbrush. With the first light of dawn, relief washed over me, a foolish hope that daylight would banish the fears of the night. It was then, as I stepped out of my tent, that the true extent of my ordeal became apparent. Surrounding the tent, imprinted in the soft earth, were boot prints, not my own, far too large, and with a tread pattern I didn't recognize. They circled the site, a silent testament to the presence I had felt. Someone had been there, watching, waiting, moving through the darkness with a purpose I could not fathom. Panic set in, a visceral reaction to the invasion of my sanctuary. This place of peace had been violated, transformed into a scene from a nightmare. The isolation I had sought now felt oppressive, a barrier between me and the safety of civilization. I packed up camp with trembling hands, Ranger by my side, his demeanor now protective, a guardian against the unseen threat. The hike back was torturous. Every shadow seemed to move, every noise a potential harbinger of danger. I realized then that the wilderness, for all its beauty, held depths of mystery and peril I had never imagined. The piney woods, with their ancient trees and hidden places, were not mine to claim. I was an intruder, and the forest had reminded me of my place. As I emerged from the forest, the weight of the experience settled heavily upon me. The boot prints, the feeling of being watched, Ranger's uncharacteristic behavior at all coalesced into a singular, unnerving truth. We are never truly alone in the wilderness. Whether it's the eyes of wildlife or those of another human, the forest sees all. In the days that followed, I wrestled with the implications of my encounter. The peace I had found in nature was now tinged with caution, a reminder of the vulnerabilities that come with venturing into the unknown. The piney woods, with their whispered secrets and hidden watchers, had changed me. I was no longer just a seeker of solitude, I was a survivor, someone who had looked into the darkness and seen something looking back. Story 6 the sky had been overcast all day, a heavy blanket of clouds threatening to unleash a storm over Fort Worth. By evening, the first rumbles of thunder echoed in the distance, a prelude to the tempest that would soon envelop the city. I had always found comfort in the sound of rain, a soothing backdrop to an evening spent indoors. However, this storm would prove to be anything but comforting. It began with the wind, a howling force that rattled windows and tested the strength of every door. I was alone, a fact that had never bothered me before, but as the storm intensified, so did a feeling of unease. The power flickered, then went out completely, plunging my home into darkness, save for the occasional flash of lightning that illuminated the rooms in stark, white light. I moved to light some candles, the soft glow offering a semblance of comfort amidst the chaos outside. That's when I heard it the distinct sound of the front doorknob turning, a slow, deliberate movement that chilled me to the bone. I froze, listening as the wind howled, trying to convince myself that it was just a trick of the storm. But then, the unmistakable sound of glass shattering in the kitchen shattered any illusion of safety. Panic surged through me, a primal response to the realization that someone was trying to break into my home. My phone was in my hand before I knew it, the emergency number dialed as I moved on instinct. The dispatcher's voice was a lifeline in the darkness a calm presence amidst my rising terror. I was instructed to find a place to hide and stay on the line. My closet, a small, cramped space filled with clothes and memories, became my sanctuary. The footsteps were what haunted me most. Slow, measured steps that moved with purpose through my home. The intruder was inside, moving closer with each passing second. I huddled in the dark, phone pressed to my ear, listening as the dispatcher assured me help was on the way. But in those moments, time stretched into eternity, each second a lifetime of fear and anticipation. The closet door seemed paper thin, a fragile barrier between me and the unknown. I held my breath, praying that the intruder would pass by, that this nightmare would end without confrontation. The footsteps grew louder, then paused, a silence more terrifying than any sound. I could hear my heart pounding, a rapid drumbeat in the quiet of the closet. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, the sound of sirens cut through the storm, a beacon of hope in the night. 
The footsteps retreated, a hurried escape that spoke of fear, a fear now mirrored in the intruder. The police arrived, securing the house, their flashlights cutting through the darkness, a symbol of safety and order restored. The aftermath of the break-in left me shaken, a lingering sense of vulnerability that pervaded every corner of my home. The broken window in the kitchen was a stark reminder of the night's events, a breach of the sanctuary I had built. The officers were kind, their assurances of safety a balm to my freight nerves, but the damage had been done. My home, once a place of comfort and solitude, now felt exposed, its walls too thin, its doors too weak. In the days that followed, I wrestled with the fear that lingered like a shadow, a constant reminder of the fragility of safety. The storm had passed, but its impact remained, a scar on the landscape of my life. I found solace in the support of friends and family, their presence a light in the darkness that had enveloped me. The break-in on that stormy night in Fort Worth changed me. It taught me the value of security, not just in locks and alarms, but in the connections we forge with those around us. My home was repaired, the window replaced, but the experience remained, a memory etched into the fabric of my being. Story 7 The night was a cloak of darkness over Highway 90, a stretch of road that cuts through the heart of Texas like a forgotten byway. I had been on the road for hours, my journey taking me further into the vast, open landscape that defines this part of the state. The monotony of the drive was almost meditative, the steady hum of the engine and the rhythm of the road lulling me into a state of calm isolation. It was late, and the absence of other travelers had gone unnoticed until the unsettling realization hit me I hadn't seen another car for hours. This stretch of Highway 90 felt disconnected from the world, a ribbon of asphalt winding through the silent, sleeping land. The absence of human presence was not unusual for late-night drives in this rural expanse, but tonight it felt oppressive, a harbinger of the surreal turn my journey was about to take. Suddenly, my rearview mirror was ablaze with light, an intense brightness that shattered the night's tranquility. A truck, large and looming, had appeared out of nowhere, its front grille a snarling beast in the glow of its headlights. It was so close I could hear the growl of its engine, a menacing rumble that filled the air with threat. The truck began to flash its lights, a staccato demand for. What? There was no room to pass, no reason for this aggression. Panic tightened its grip as the truck edged even closer, its intentions unclear but unmistakably hostile. I pressed down on the accelerator, hoping to put some distance between us, but the truck matched my speed with ease, a predator toying with its prey. The road ahead was a void, no turnoffs, no escape, just the endless stretch of Highway 90 in the night. The truck made its move then, veering dangerously close, its bulk a shadow that threatened to engulf me. I could feel the tug of its draft, a physical force trying to pull me into its orbit, to run me off the road. My heart raced, adrenaline coursing through my veins as I fought to maintain control, to keep my car steady against the assault. For miles this macabre dance continued, the truck alternating between aggressive tailgating and attempts to sideswipe me. My mind raced, searching for a way out, but the road offered no salvation, only the relentless, forward push into the night. The isolation of Highway 90, once a benign backdrop to my travels, now felt like a trap, a stage set for a nightmare from which there was no waking. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, the pursuit ended. The truck pulled back, its engine's roar fading as it turned off onto a side road that seemed to appear out of the darkness just for it. The lights vanished, swallowed by the night, leaving me alone once again on the highway. The rest of the drive was a blur of heightened alertness and reflection. My hands shook on the wheel, my mind replaying the encounter over and over, trying to make sense of it. Was it a case of road rage? A misguided attempt at intimidation? Or something far more sinister, a game of cat and mouse on a lonely Texas highway? The answer seemed as elusive as the truck's sudden disappearance. Arriving home, the relief of safety was tinged with the surreal afterglow of the experience. It was an encounter that would stay with me, a stark reminder of the vulnerability that comes with traversing the vast, open spaces of the night. Highway 90, 
with its stretches of solitude and darkness, had revealed a face I had never expected to see. A shadow realm where the rules of the road and the norms of society seemed suspended. In the days that followed, I found myself reflecting on the nature of fear and the fragility of our sense of security. The open road, a symbol of freedom and adventure, had shown me its other side, a place where the unknown lurks just beyond the reach of the headlights, where danger can emerge from the shadows without warning. Story 8 I've always had a fascination with the forgotten, the places left behind by time and memory. So when rumors reached me of an abandoned asylum on the outskirts of San Antonio, my curiosity was piqued. Stories swirled around this place, tales of tragedy and unexplained occurrences, whispers of the souls that lingered in its halls. Despite the warnings, or perhaps because of them, I felt a magnetic pull, a desire to see for myself the secrets it held. The decision to go was impulsive, a sudden resolve that found me standing before the imposing structure as the sun dipped below the horizon. The building loomed, a relic of a bygone era, its once stately facade now marred by time and neglect. Vines crept up its walls and windows, empty of glass, stared out like dark, unblinking eyes. It was a place that whispered of its past, inviting and forbidding all at once. With a deep breath, I pushed open the heavy front door, its hinges groaning in protest. The air inside was stale, thick with the dust of decades. My flashlight cut through the darkness, revealing a world frozen in time. The grand entrance hall, with its peeling paint and crumbling plaster, led to corridors that branched off into shadow. Everywhere, remnants of the asylum's former life lay scattered a wheelchair abandoned mid-hallway, medical records strewn across the floor their words a testament to the lives that had passed through these walls. I wandered the halls, each room revealing more of the asylum's secrets. In one, beds stood in neat rows, their metal frames rusted, the mattresses long since rotted away. In another I found the remnants of a common area, chairs arranged in a circle, a silent gathering of ghosts. Everywhere, the signs of decay were punctuated by the beauty of abandonment, nature reclaiming what had been left behind. But as the night deepened, so did the sense of unease. The quiet was oppressive, the only sounds my own footsteps and the occasional drip of water. It was as if the building itself was holding its breath, waiting. I tried to shake the feeling, to focus on the exploration, but a growing sense of dread gnawed at the edges of my resolve. It was then, in the depths of the asylum, that I realized I was not alone. The signs were subtle at first a shadow that moved against the beam of my flashlight, a whisper of movement in the periphery of my vision. I told myself it was my imagination, the tricks of a mind strained by the darkness and the stories that clung to this place. Determined to leave, I retraced my steps, seeking the familiarity of the entrance. But as I approached the door I had come through, my heart sank. It was closed, the heavy bolt drawn across it a barrier as insurmountable as it was inexplicable. Panic surged, a tide that threatened to overwhelm me. I pushed against the door, my efforts futile against its immovable weight. The realization that I was trapped settled over me like a shroud. The corridors, once a maze to explore, became a labyrinth with no exit, each turn leading me further into despair. I called out, my voice swallowed by the vast emptiness of the asylum. There was no reply only the echo of my own fear. Hours passed, or so it seemed. Time had no meaning in this place, each minute stretching into eternity. My flashlight, once a beacon of security, flickered and died, leaving me in darkness. I was alone, surrounded by the remnants of lives I had never known, trapped in a story that had become my own. But the human spirit is resilient. In the depths of fear, in the shadow of the inexplicable, there is a light that endures. I found mine in the resolve to not be another ghost in the halls of the asylum. With renewed determination, I searched for another way out, my hands guiding me in the darkness. And then, when hope seemed lost, I found it a window, its frame rotted away, a passage back to the world I had left behind. The night air was cool against my skin, a balm to the fever of fear. I climbed through, leaving the asylum and its shadows behind, emerging into the moonlight. A rebirth from the darkness. Story 9 
The vast, open spaces of Texas have always held a certain allure for me, a promise of endless horizons and untold stories hidden beneath the sun-bleached surface. It was this allure that found me on the road one late evening, the city of Amarillo my waypoint in the sprawling landscape. Hunger and fatigue led me to a diner that seemed to materialize out of the darkness, its neon sign a beacon of comfort in the vast emptiness of the night. The interior of the diner was a capsule of time, with vinyl booths and a counter lined with stools, a jukebox in the corner playing softly. I settled into a booth, the menu in my hands more a formality than a necessity, the allure of coffee and pie too strong to resist. It was then, in that moment of solitude that he appeared. He slid into the booth across from me, uninvited and unnoticed until he was just there, as if materialized from the diner's own memories. Covered in dust, his clothes worn by travel and time, he seemed a part of the landscape itself, a human embodiment of the desert that stretched endlessly beyond the city limits. His voice when he spoke was a whisper, raspy and low, as if carrying the weight of secrets too terrible for a louder utterance. He told me a story, his eyes never leaving mine, a story of something he had seen in the desert, something beyond the realm of the known. It was a tale woven with fear and wonder, of lights that danced in the darkness, not of this world, and of shadows that moved with intent, sentient and ominous. He spoke of a silence so profound it felt like a pressure against the ears, of a cold that seeped into the bones despite the desert heat. As he recounted his tale, the diner around us seemed to fade, the background noise diminishing until it was just his voice, a solitary thread in the fabric of the night. He described how he had stumbled upon an area, miles from any civilization, where the ground was scorched, the sand turned to glass, an epicenter of an event unexplained and terrifying. There, he had felt it, an overwhelming sense of dread, a primal fear that urged him to flee and never look back. The details were sparse, the narrative fragmented, as if recalling the memory was a physical pain, but the conviction in his whisper, the fear in his eyes, lent a chilling credibility to his words. He spoke of an urge to warn others, to tell the world of the horror that lurked in the desert's heart, hidden by the vastness and the isolation. And then, as abruptly as he had begun, he stopped. He stood, his movements sudden but deliberate, and without another word he left the diner, disappearing into the night as mysteriously as he had arrived. I sat there, frozen, the remnants of his presence hanging in the air, a tangible unease that settled around me like a shroud. The diner, once a haven of light and warmth, now felt oppressive, the shadows deeper, the silence punctuated by the soft hum of the neon sign. The story he had whispered across the table was a seed of fear, planted in the fertile ground of my imagination, growing roots that twisted around my thoughts. I left shortly after the night air cool against my skin, a stark contrast to the warmth of the diner. The drive out of Amarillo was a journey through a landscape transformed by the stranger's tale. Every shadow seemed to hold a threat, every flicker of light in the distance a sign of the unknown. The desert, a place I had always regarded with awe and reverence, now harbored a sense of dread, a vast stage for horrors unseen. The story he had shared, whether a product of madness, a tale of caution, or a warning of something all too real, stayed with me. It became a part of my travels, a narrative that unfolded with each mile, a constant reminder of the mysteries that lie in the heart of the desert, secrets covered by sand and silence. Story 10 The night was unremarkable, the kind that promised nothing but the soft embrace of sleep and the slow march of hours until dawn. Our family home, nestled in the heart of East Texas, had always been a bastion of security and love, its walls steeped in the laughter and tears of generations. That night, however, it became a crucible, testing the bonds of family and the will to survive. I awoke to an alien sensation, the acrid sting of smoke infiltrating my dreams, transforming them into nightmares. Confusion gave way to horror as the reality of the situation pierced the haze of sleep. Our home, our sanctuary, was ablaze, the flames a ravenous beast consuming everything in its path. The urgency of the moment propelled me out of bed, the heat and noise a chaotic symphony that drowned out rational thought. My sister, asleep in the room next to mine, was oblivious to the danger that encroached with every passing second. 
rousing her from sleep. I was met with the same disbelief and fear that had gripped me moments before. We were two souls, adrift in a sea of fire, clinging to each other as the world around us threatened to collapse. The stairs, our usual path to safety, were an inferno, the fire a gatekeeper that barred the way with flames. With the lower floors consumed, we were prisoners on the second floor, our options dwindling as the smoke thickened, a tangible darkness that choked the air and obscured the way forward. In that moment of despair, our eyes turned to the window, a portal to the night that offered a slim chance of escape. The decision to jump was not made lightly, it was a choice born of desperation, a gamble with fate that held the keys to life or death. The ground below, shrouded in darkness, offered no promises, only the uncertain hope of survival. Together we stood at the precipice, the heat at our backs an insistent hand that pushed us towards the unknown. The fire illuminated the night, painting the sky in shades of orange and red, a backdrop of terror to the decision that lay before us. Hand in hand, we counted the beats of our racing hearts, each one a drum roll to the leap of faith we were about to take. And then, with a breath that tasted of smoke and fear, we jumped. The fall was a lifetime condensed into seconds, a freefall through darkness that ended with the unforgiving embrace of the ground. Pain flared, a sharp contrast to the adrenaline that coursed through our veins, but we were alive, broken perhaps, but together and breathing. The fire raged on, a beacon in the night that drew the attention of neighbors and firefighters, a community that came together in the face of disaster. As we lay there, looking back at the home that had nurtured us, now a pyre in the darkness, a myriad of emotions flooded through us grief for what was lost, gratitude for the lives spared, and a newfound resilience that sprang from the ashes of tragedy. The days that followed were a testament to the strength of the human spirit, a period of healing and rebuilding that brought our family closer together. The fire, for all its destruction, failed to consume the love that bound us, serving instead as a forge that tempered our bonds, making them stronger and more resilient. The house fire in East Texas became a part of our story, a chapter marked by loss but defined by survival. It taught us the value of life and the impermanence of material things, lessons learned in the crucible of disaster. As we rebuilt our lives, the memories of that night remained, a reminder of the fragility of existence and the power of hope. Story 11 Under the vast expanse of the Texas night sky, I found myself walking home, the streets of El Paso quiet and deserted. The night was deep, the kind that swallows sound and makes every light seem distant, a solitary journey through shadows. In my quest for the comfort of my bed, I chose a path less traveled, one that promised a quicker return but ventured closer to the realm of the unknown. The train tracks cutting through the city like arteries of steel, offered a direct route, their promise of expedience luring me from the safety of the lit streets. The desert air was cool, a stark contrast to the heat of the day, carrying with it the whispers of the night. The tracks stretched before me, twin lines of silver bathed in the pale glow of the moon, a path illuminated by the stars themselves. It was a route I had taken before, familiar yet transformed in the nocturnal hours, a different world under the cloak of darkness. I walked with purpose, my steps confident yet cautious, aware of the solitude that enveloped me. The city seemed to recede with every step, leaving behind the sounds of civilization, replaced by the soft sighs of the desert wind. It was in this isolation, with the night as my companion, that I sensed it an air of anticipation, as if the night itself held its breath. Without warning, the silence shattered. A train horn blared, a sound so sudden, so close, it seemed to erupt from the very ground beneath me. Panic seized me, a primal surge of adrenaline that propelled me from the tracks, my body acting on instinct honed by the fear of imminent death. I threw myself aside, landing hard on the gravel that bordered the tracks, the roar of the train filling my ears, a cacophony that drowned out thought. But as quickly as it had come, the sound ceased. Gasping for breath, heart pounding. I dared to look back, expecting to see the receding lights of the train as it continued on its nocturnal journey. Instead, there was silence and absence so profound it felt like a void. The tracks lay empty, bathed in moonlight, untouched by the passage of the phantom train that had threatened to claim me. 
Trembling, I rose, my mind struggling to comprehend what had occurred. There was no logical explanation, no reasoning that could account for the sound, the terror, and the subsequent emptiness. The desert night, once a canvas of beauty and tranquility, now felt oppressive, charged with an unseen menace. The walk home became a flight, each step driven by the urge to escape the invisible threat that lurked in the shadows. The city, once a destination, now represented safety, a refuge from the mysteries of the night. When I finally reached the familiar streets, the lights of El Paso a welcome embrace, I could not shake the feeling of unease, the sense that something had changed. The experience haunted me, a memory that refused to be dismissed as imagination or fatigue. I found myself drawn to the history of the tracks, a quest for understanding that led me to tales of tragedy and loss, stories of a train that had met its end in a catastrophe long forgotten by the city, but remembered by the desert. It was said that on certain nights, when the conditions mirrored those of the disaster, the phantom train would emerge, a spectral reminder of the past. The realization that I had encountered something beyond the realm of the known, a fragment of history replaying itself in the present, was both terrifying and mesmerizing. It was a brush with the supernatural, a glimpse into the mysteries that lie just beyond the veil of our understanding. The tracks, once a shortcut, now held a different meaning for me. They were a boundary between the worlds of the living and the echoes of the past, a place where the two could momentarily collide. My encounter with the midnight train in El Paso was a journey not just through the city, but through the layers of time itself, a confrontation with the ghosts that linger in the shadows of history. Story 12 I've always been drawn to the water. It's a part of me, maybe because I grew up near the coast, where the ocean was a constant, comforting presence. But nothing could have prepared me for the labyrinth of Cato Lake. Its cypress trees, draped in Spanish moss, create a hauntingly beautiful yet eerie landscape. I was captivated by stories of its maze-like waterways and hidden secrets. So I took my kayak to explore it, a decision that led to the most terrifying night of my life. It was a clear morning when I set out, the sun casting a golden glow on the water. The lake was calm, its surface like glass, reflecting the sky and trees so perfectly it was hard to tell where one ended and the other began. I paddled through narrow passages and open areas, mesmerized by the beauty and silence, broken only by the occasional bird call. I felt alone but not lonely, surrounded by nature's splendor. But as the day wore on, the sky turned a palette of oranges and pinks, signaling dusk. That's when I realized I was lost. The passages that seemed inviting before now twisted and turned into each other, creating a maze I couldn't escape. I tried to retrace my path, but every direction looked the same, with towering cypress trees as my only markers. A creeping panic set in as the light faded, and I found myself enveloped in darkness, with only the moon and stars to guide me. The night brought a chill, and the once peaceful lake transformed. Sounds echoed across the water rustles, splashes, and the occasional thump. I told myself it was just fish, or maybe a beaver. But the rational part of my brain whispered that not all movements in the water were benign. Legends of the lake spoke of creatures lurking beneath, waiting for the cover of night. I laughed off these tales during the day, but alone, in the dark, imagination became my enemy. I decided to keep moving, hoping to find my way by staying close to the shore. But the sounds followed, growing closer, more frequent. My heart pounded in my chest, every sound amplifying my fear. The water around me seemed alive with ripples and waves created by unseen forces. I paddled harder, desperate to escape the invisible pursuers. Then silence. A silence so heavy, it felt like a warning. I stopped, listening, scanning the darkness. That's when I heard it a low, guttural growl, not far behind me. It was unlike any animal I knew, a sound that chilled me to the bone. I couldn't see anything but I felt its presence, a predator lurking in the shadows. Panic took over, and I paddled with all my might, not caring where I was going, only that I needed to get away. Hours passed, or maybe it was minutes. Time lost meaning as I navigated through the dark, driven by fear and a primal urge to survive. Eventually, exhaustion took over, and I found a small, somewhat clear area to rest. My body was on the brink, 
my mind tormented by what I had heard. Sleep was a distant dream, every noise a potential threat, but even in my heightened state of fear, exhaustion won, and I drifted into a fitful sleep. Dawn brought relief and a renewed determination to find my way back. The light revealed the beauty of Cattle Lake once more, but the terror of the night lingered. I paddled, using the sun to guide me, until I finally found a familiar landmark. Relief washed over me as I realized I was no longer lost. I made my way back to where I started, each stroke taking me further from the nightmare. Story 13 My interest in Terlingua had always been more than just a passing fascination. It was as if the ghost town called out to me, its stories of old miners and lost fortunes echoing across the deserts of Texas. I had read every article, every little piece of history I could find, but nothing prepared me for the experience of being there as the veil between day and night grew thin. After the unsettling encounter in the cemetery, I drove back to the small motel I had booked for the night, my mind racing with questions. Who was whispering my name, and why? Was it merely the wind playing tricks, or was Terlingua home to something far more mysterious? Despite my fear, a part of me longed to return, to uncover the truth hidden in the shadows of the abandoned town. The following morning, under the glaring sun, Terlingua felt less menacing. The ghost town, now illuminated, revealed its beauty the rugged landscape, the vibrant hues of the desert flora, and the architectural remnants of a once thriving community. I spent the day exploring, capturing photos and speaking with locals. I learned of the town's rich history, from its boom in the early 1900s as a quicksilver mining hub to its gradual decline. The stories of hardship, resilience, and the unbreakable spirit of the Terlingua community filled me with admiration. However, as the day waned, so did my resolve. The memory of the previous night's terror lingered, casting a long shadow over my curiosity. Yet, something inexplicable drew me back to the cemetery as the sun once again began to set. I convinced myself that I needed closure to face my fears and prove that they were unfounded. With cautious steps, I walked among the graves, reading the names and dates, some faded by time. The whispers did not return and the oppressive feeling of being watched had lifted, replaced by a somber tranquility. I was about to leave, my nerves somewhat calmed, when I noticed a grave set apart from the others. It was newer, the inscription clear Sarah Elizabeth Moore, beloved daughter and sister a chill ran through me, not from fear, but from a sudden, inexplicable sadness. I sat by the grave, wondering about Sarah and her life. It was then, in the stillness of the evening, that I heard a soft, sorrowful sigh. I turned, half expecting to see someone, but I was alone, or so I thought. Why are you so sad? The voice was gentle, almost melodic, and undeniably real. I stood, scanning my surroundings, but saw no one. Who's there, I asked, my voice betraying my fear. I'm here. I'm always here, the voice replied, its source still unseen. The air around me grew colder, and the atmosphere charged with an energy I couldn't explain. I don't mean to scare you, I just... I saw you yesterday, and you seemed different. The voice sounded closer now, and I spun around, trying to locate the speaker. That's when I saw her a figure, translucent and shimmering, standing a few feet away. My heart stopped. She was young, no older than twenty, with a sadness in her eyes that mirror eyes that mirror voice. You can see me, she stated, more than asked a look of wonder crossing her face. Not many can I nodded, too shocked to speak. My name is Sarah, she continued, her form becoming clearer. Sarah Moore, this is my grave. She gestured towards the stone I had been sitting by moments earlier. Questions flooded my mind. Was I dreaming? Had the ghost town story seeped into my consciousness, manifesting as a hallucination? But Sarah felt real, and the chill in the air, the energy that surrounded us, was unlike anything I had ever experienced. I don't understand, I finally managed to say. Why are you here? Sarah's expression turned somber. I can't leave. My family. They left her lingua long ago, but I... I stayed behind. There's something keeping me here, something unresolved. But I don't know what it is. Her gaze met mine, pleading for understanding. 
The skepticism I might have felt in any other situation was replaced by an overwhelming desire to help. What can I do, I asked, my earlier fear replaced by determination. I'm not sure she admitted. But you're the first person who has been able to see me, to hear me, in so long. Maybe you're the key to helping me find peace. As the sun set completely, casting us into twilight, Sarah told me her story. She spoke of her life in Terlingua, of the joy and the hardship, and of her untimely death, the details of which were lost to her. She remembered only the feeling of sudden darkness and then, nothing, until she found herself bound to the place of her passing. We spent hours talking, or so it seemed, until the first light of dawn began to break. Sarah's form began to fade with the rising sun, her voice becoming a mere whisper. Please don't forget me, she implored as she disappeared completely, leaving me alone once again. I stood there for a long time, processing the night's events. As I walked back to my car, the first rays of sunlight warming the cool desert air, I knew I couldn't leave Terlingua not yet. I had to help Sarah find the peace she longed for, to uncover the mystery of her lingering presence. And perhaps, in doing so, I would uncover more about Terlingua and myself than I ever thought possible. Resolved to help Sarah, I spent the next few days immersing myself in the history of Terlingua, seeking any clue that might explain her lingering presence. I visited the local library, where dusty tomes and ancient newspapers whispered secrets of the past. I spoke with the oldest residents, whose memories painted a vivid picture of Terlingua's glory days and its eventual decline. Each piece of the puzzle brought me closer to understanding, yet the answer to Sarah's predicament remained elusive. One evening, as I pored over old documents in the library, I stumbled upon a mention of the Moore family. There were prominent figures in Terlingua during the mining boom, contributing significantly to the community. However, their story took a tragic turn with the untimely death of their daughter, Sarah, in an accident. The details were scarce, but it was noted that her death had cast a long shadow over the family, leading to their eventual departure from Terlingua. Armed with this new information, I returned to the cemetery, hoping to contact Sarah again. As the sun set, casting a golden glow over the graves, I felt the now familiar chill in the air. Sarah, I called softly, I found something about your family. She appeared before me, just as she had that first night. What did you find, she asked, a note of eagerness in her voice. I told her about the accident and her family's prominence in the community, watching as a range of emotions flickered across her face. That's it, she said a spark of realization in her eyes. The accident, I remember now. There was a dispute, a disagreement with another family. It was silly, really, but it escalated. I, I was caught in the middle. That's how I died. The pieces of the puzzle began to fit together. Sarah's death wasn't just a tragic accident, it was tied to a deeper conflict, one that had perhaps never been resolved. Do you think that's why you're still here? I asked, because the dispute was never settled. It might be she replied thoughtfully, but how do we find peace now? Everyone involved is long gone. I considered her words, realizing that if the dispute was the root of Sarah's unrest, then reconciliation, even symbolic, might be the key to her release. Maybe we need to find a way to honor your memory and bring closure to the past, to acknowledge what happened and express a desire for peace. Sarah nodded, a hopeful look in her eyes. Over the next few days, we devised a plan. With the help of the local community, we organized a memorial service for Sarah, inviting anyone with ties to the town's history. The service would not only honor her, but also serve as a gesture of reconciliation for all past grievances among Terlingua's former residents. The day of the service was marked by a rare, gentle rain, as if the desert itself was mourning. People gathered in the cemetery, some curious, others solemn, all united by a sense of purpose. I spoke about Sarah, about her life and the circumstances of her death, emphasizing the importance of forgiveness and unity. As the service concluded, a rainbow appeared in the clearing skies, casting a serene light over the gravesite. As the crowd dispersed, I felt a presence beside me. Sarah stood there, more radiant than I had ever seen her. Thank you, she said, her voice filled with gratitude and peace. I can feel that the bond holding me here is gone. I'm free to move on. 
Tears filled my eyes as I watched her begin to fade, her smile the last thing to disappear. Goodbye, Sarah, I whispered, knowing she had found the peace she deserved. In the days that followed, Terlingua felt different to me. The town still held its mysteries and its ghosts, but I had uncovered a layer of its history that few knew. Sarah's story was a reminder of the power of reconciliation and the importance of remembering the past, not as a chain that binds us, but as a lesson from which we can grow. Story 14 Driving through West Texas had always seemed like a journey through another world. The vast, open landscape stretched endlessly, offering a sense of isolation and freedom I'd found nowhere else. My trip had been uneventful until I reached I-10, where the sky began to change ominously. What started as a clear day quickly turned as I noticed a wall of dust forming on the horizon. It was fascinating at first, a natural phenomenon I'd only seen in documentaries. But fascination turned to dread as the dust storm approached with an unexpected speed, engulfing the landscape in a thick, brown haze. I had little time to react. Within minutes, visibility dropped to zero, and the world outside my car windows disappeared into a swirling mass of dust and sand. Panic set in as I realized I couldn't see the road ahead, or anything else for that matter. Pulling over felt dangerous, but continuing to drive was out of the question. I managed to guide my car to the shoulder, hoping I was far enough from the roadway to avoid becoming a hazard. The sounds of my hazard lights clicking felt eerily loud in the sudden silence that enveloped the car. The storm's intensity was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. The wind howled, a haunting symphony that drowned out all other sounds, shaking my car as if it were a mere toy. Then, the collision started. The sound of metal crunching against metal came from all around, the cacophony of crashes punctuating the storm's roar. Each impact sent a shock wave of fear through me, leaving me to wonder how close the unseen disasters were happening. I was trapped, blind and helpless, praying for the storm to pass. As time stretched on, each minute felt longer than the last. I tried to calm myself, focusing on my breathing and trying to stay as still as possible, afraid any movement might somehow attract disaster. The air inside the car grew heavy, filled with the fine dust that found its way through every nook and cranny. I covered my mouth with my shirt, trying to filter the air I breathed, but the gritty taste of dust coated my tongue. In the midst of my fear, I began to hear voices. At first, I thought the wind was playing tricks on me, but then the voices became clearer, almost as if someone was right outside my car. Panic surged anew. Were people walking out there in the storm, risking their lives in the zero visibility? Or was I beginning to hallucinate my mind conjuring voices in the overwhelming isolation? The voices grew louder, more insistent. I strained to listen, to understand what they were saying, but the words were lost in the howl of the wind. I considered opening my door, calling out to whoever might be out there, but fear held me back. What if opening the door invited in more than just the storm? The possibility of coming face to face with something or someone unknown in the blinding dust was terrifying. As I battled my fears and debated my next move, the storm's fury seemed to reach a crescendo. The car rocked violently, and I braced myself, closing my eyes against the fear that threatened to overwhelm me. It was then, in that moment of sheer terror, that something unexpected happened. A calm voice, clear and close, cut through the din. Stay in your car. Help is on the way the message was simple, but in the chaos of the storm, it was a lifeline. I never found out where the voice came from or who had spoken those words. As suddenly as it had escalated, the storm began to subside. The wind's howl faded and the dust settled, revealing a world that looked entirely different from the one I had known just hours before. Bars were strewn about the highway, some collided, others simply abandoned. Emergency services moved between the vehicles, checking on the occupants. The sun broke through the lingering dust, casting long shadows and highlighting the surreal scene. In the aftermath of the storm, I stepped out of my car, my legs shaky but relief flooding through me. I was alive, unharmed, though the same couldn't be said for everyone caught in the storm's path. As I watched the rescue efforts and spoke with other survivors, I couldn't shake the memory of the voice that had reached me in my darkest moment. Was it real, or had my mind conjured it in desperation? 
The dust storm on I-10 was a reminder of nature's power and the thin line between normalcy and chaos. As I continued my journey through West Texas, the landscape once again open and inviting. I carried with me the memory of that day, the fear, the isolation, and the mysterious voice that offered hope in the midst of despair. It was a story I would never forget, a moment in time that had changed me, reminding me of the fragility of life and the unexpected ways we can find strength. Story 15 I've always found the State Fair of Texas to be an exhilarating blend of chaos and delight, where the smells of fried everything mingle with the sounds of laughter and mechanical rides. It was the kind of place where, amidst thousands of strangers, you could lose yourself and forget the outside world. At least that's what it used to be for me before that day. It began as an ordinary outing. The sun was a golden giant in the sky, and the air was filled with the electric energy of anticipation. I was there for the sheer joy of it, wandering among the crowds, taking in the sights of towering rides and the sounds of games. It felt liberating, being just another face in the crowd, anonymous and free. But that sense of anonymity shattered when I felt it a prickling sensation on the back of my neck, the unmistakable feeling of being watched. I brushed it off initially, attributing it to the crowd's density, but the sensation persisted, growing stronger, more pointed. Turning, I caught glimpses of a figure. It was fleeting, just quick flashes of someone's presence in the crowd behind me, always there, yet never close enough to confront. I tried to convince myself it was paranoia, the product of an overactive imagination. Yet, as I moved through the fair, the figure seemed ever-present, a shadow among shadows watching but never approaching. The joy of the fair began to sour, each laugh and scream from the rides taking on a menacing quality. By the time I decided to leave, night had cloaked the fair in artificial neon light. I remember walking to my car, the sensation of being followed nagging at me. It wasn't until I was home, door locked and curtains drawn, that I discovered it a note, folded neatly and sitting in my pocket. I know what you did. The message was scrawled in a hasty, almost frantic manner, but what chilled me to the bone was the realization that the handwriting was unmistakably mine. How could that be? I thought racking my brain for any memory of writing such a note, any wrongdoing it could refer to. But my mind was a blank slate, confusion and fear swirling into a tight knot in my stomach. Sleep was elusive that night, every creak and whisper of the house a potential harbinger of some looming threat. The note was a mystery, one that hinted at a darkness I couldn't remember. In the following days, I became obsessed with it, turning it over in my mind, trying to decipher its meaning and origin. The fair, once a place of joy, had become the scene of an unnerving mystery, one that seemed to revolve around me. The notion of going to the police crossed my mind, but what would I say? That I was being stalked by someone who could mimic my handwriting perfectly. That I received a note from myself accusing me of something I couldn't recall. It sounded like madness, the kind of story that gets dismissed out of hand, so I chose to investigate on my own diving into my past, looking for anything that might shed light on the note's meaning. I pored over old journals, emails, and messages searching for any clue, any forgotten deed that might have come back to haunt me. Yet, I found nothing out of the ordinary, just the mundane details of an ordinary life. It was during this period of frantic searching that the second note appeared. This time, it was left on my windshield after a day at work. Same message, same handwriting. The implication was clear someone was watching me, someone who knew me intimately enough to replicate my handwriting, to invade my personal space with such ease. Panic set in, a constant companion that whispered dire warnings with every unknown call or shadow. I began to avoid going out, especially alone. My home, once a sanctuary, felt like a prison, its walls closing in with the weight of the unanswered question, what did I do? The turning point came unexpectedly a memory surfacing in a dream. It was fragmented, a series of flashes that left me waking in a cold sweat. A party years ago, laughter and music blending into a cacophony. A moment of carelessness, a mistake made and forgotten in the haze of youth. Could it be related? I wondered, the memory elusive, slipping away when I tried to grasp it fully. It was the only lead I had, a thread to follow in a tangled web of confusion. 
So I began to reach out, tentatively at first, to old friends who had been there, who might remember what I could not. The responses varied, but a picture began to form of a night that had started in fun and ended in tragedy. An accident, they said, something I had caused but had been too drunk to remember. Guilt and fear, a potent mix, had apparently driven me to suppress the memory, to bury it so deep that it took a mysterious stalker's intervention to bring it to light. The realization was a gut punch, a wave of horror and regret that left me reeling. How could I have forgotten something so significant, so damning? And who was behind the notes? Someone who had been there, someone affected by my actions, seeking retribution. The questions multiplied, each one a weight added to the burden of guilt I now carried. As I write this, I'm half expecting another note, a further clue to this twisted game of cat and mouse. The fear is constant, a shadow that looms over every moment of my life. But there's also a determination, a need to confront the past, to face whatever consequences my actions have wrought. To the person watching, to the keeper of my darkest secret, I say this I remember now, and I'm ready to face what comes next. With the realization of my forgotten past, the world around me took on a grim hue. The joy of daily life was overshadowed by the weight of guilt and the constant fear of retribution. Yet, in this darkness, a resolve formed within me. If I was to move forward, I needed to confront my past head-on, no matter the cost. My investigation into that fateful night years ago became an obsession. I reached out to everyone who had been at the party, piecing together their accounts with the fragments of my own memory. The picture that emerged was one of recklessness and tragedy, a moment of carelessness that had resulted in an accident, changing lives forever. The specifics, however, remained elusive, hidden behind a veil of time and suppressed memories. The third note arrived not long after, left on my doorstep. This time, the message was different, meet me at the fair. The words sent a chill down my spine. Going back to the place where this all began felt like stepping into a trap. But what choice did I have? Ignoring the note wasn't an option, the need for answers for closure was too strong. The night of the meeting was surreal. The fair, once a place of vibrant life, now felt like a stage set for a final confrontation. The neon lights cast long shadows, and the laughter of the crowd sounded distant, almost otherworldly. My heart pounded as I moved through the fairgrounds, every step taking me closer to an unknown fate. I spotted the figure waiting by the ferris wheel, a lone silhouette against the riot of lights and colors. As I approached, the figure turned, and I found myself face to face with someone I hadn't expected, Alex, a friend from those days, someone who had been closer to me than a brother. The recognition was mutual, and for a moment we simply stared at each other, the years and secrets between us a tangible barrier. Then Alex spoke, his voice heavy with emotion. I had to make you remember, he said, the words laden with pain and accusation. The story came out in pieces, a shared confession under the shadow of the ferris wheel. The accident had been worse than I'd feared, resulting in serious injury for Alex's younger sister, a fact I'd been too drunk to remember and too cowardly to face in the aftermath. Alex had never forgiven me, nor had he let me forget, even when I'd buried the memory so deep. Why now, I asked, the question a whisper in the night, because it's time, Alex said, the note of finality in his voice unmistakable. Time for you to face what you did, to make amends if you can. I couldn't let you go on pretending it never happened. The conversation that followed was a reckoning, years of guilt and regret laid bare. Alex had been the one behind the notes, using my own handwriting a skill he'd learned in our youth to force me to confront my past. It was a cruel method, but undeniably effective. I was faced with the truth of my actions, the harm I'd caused to someone I cared about, and the necessity of living with that knowledge. In the end, Alex and I parted ways, the gulf between us too wide to bridge completely, but with a sense of understanding that hadn't been there before. I was left to ponder the path forward, knowing that forgiveness was a long road, one that might never end. The State Fair of Texas would never be the same for me, a place of joy transformed into a site of personal reckoning. But in that transformation lay a lesson, a reminder of the consequences of our actions and the importance of facing them, no matter how painful. As I write this, I know that the journey ahead is uncertain. 
Making amends is a process, not a single act, and the road to forgiveness is fraught with difficulty. But for the first time since that fateful night, I feel a sense of purpose, a determination to right the wrongs of my past, as much as such a thing is possible. Story 16 Embarking on the second half of my narrative, the weight of my guilt and the dread of confrontation had become my constant shadows, looming over my every action. It was in this tumultuous state that I resolved to uncover the identity of the person behind the notes, a decision that propelled me into a deeper abyss than I could have ever imagined. Determined, I started retracing the events of that fateful night, reaching out to more people, piecing together the fragments of memory that had been buried under years of subconscious denial. Each conversation, each revelation, felt like peeling back layers of myself, exposing the raw, unvarnished truth of my actions. The accident, it turned out, had far-reaching consequences, affecting lives in ways I hadn't dared to acknowledge. The more I learned, the heavier the burden of my guilt became. Sleep eluded me, replaced by endless nights of rumination and dread. It was during one of these sleepless nights that the third note appeared, more ominous than the others meet me at the fair. The message was clear, a summons I couldn't ignore. It was time to face the architect of my torment to confront the past head on. With a mixture of fear and resolve, I returned to the State Fair of Texas, the place where this twisted saga had begun. The fair was as vibrant and chaotic as ever, a stark contrast to the turmoil churning within me. I wandered through the crowds, every sense heightened, searching for the figure that had haunted me. Time seemed to stretch, each minute a test of my resolve. And then I saw him a figure standing apart from the revelry, cloaked in the anonymity of the crowd yet undeniably present. As our eyes met, a shiver ran down my spine. There was a familiarity in his gaze, a reflection of the guilt and fear that had become my constant companions. Approaching him felt like crossing an immense distance, each step a journey through the years of denial and suppression. When I finally stood before him, the world around us seemed to fade, the sounds of the fair a distant echo. He spoke first, his voice a mirror of my own turmoil. You don't remember me, but I remember you his words were a key, unlocking the floodgates of memory. Suddenly, the night of the accident was no longer a fragmented puzzle but a vivid, haunting tapestry of events. He was the brother of the person affected by my recklessness, a life altered forever by a moment of carelessness. His anger and grief were palpable, a living testament to the ripple effects of my actions. Yet there was no malice in his words, only a profound sorrow and a desire for acknowledgement, for the recognition of the pain caused. The conversation that followed was one of the hardest of my life. I listened, truly listened to the stories of how the accident had shattered lives, of the struggles and challenges that had followed. And in turn, I spoke not to justify or defend, but to accept responsibility, to offer the only thing I could my sincere, heartfelt apology. It was a moment of raw, painful honesty, a catharsis that brought no relief, only the stark realization of the consequences of my actions. The notes, it turned out, were his way of forcing me to confront the past to shatter the walls of denial I had built around myself. As we parted ways, a sense of finality hung in the air. The mystery of the notes had been solved, but the journey was far from over. The path to forgiveness, both seeking it and offering it to myself, would be long and fraught with challenges. Yet, there was a glimmer of hope, a possibility of redemption through acknowledgement and change. The State Fair of Texas, once a place of joy and freedom, had become a crucible of transformation, a battleground where I faced my deepest fears and darkest truths. The person who left the fair that night was vastly different from the one who had entered, forever changed by the encounter and the revelations it had brought. In the end, the notes were not just messages of accusation but catalysts for a profound personal reckoning, an opportunity to confront the shadows of the past and emerge, albeit scarred, with a newfound understanding of the complexities of guilt, forgiveness, and the inexorable interconnectedness of our actions and their consequences on the lives of others. As I move forward, the journey of atonement continues, each day a step towards reconciliation with the past and a hope for a future where the lessons learned serve as a beacon for better choices, for myself and for those whose lives intersect with mine.
Story 17 Living in Waco, Texas, meant tornado warnings were a part of life a backdrop to spring and early summer, as common as the bluebonnets blooming along the highways. I had grown accustomed to the shrill wails of sirens cutting through the air, a warning to seek shelter from nature's fury. Yet, on that particular evening, the atmosphere in my home felt charged, the air dense as if holding its breath in anticipation. The day had been peculiarly calm, with a heavy stillness that seemed to muffle sounds and dim the sunlight, casting a sepia tone over everything. My neighbors, usually out tending to their gardens or enjoying the late afternoon warmth, were nowhere to be seen, their homes buttoned up tight. The local news had been reporting on the storm system developing to the west, but in Texas, such forecasts were as regular as morning coffee. The sirens started just as the sun began its descent, painting the sky in shades of orange and pink so vivid they felt almost apocalyptic. This time, however, the sound was different, more urgent, a relentless, piercing scream that seemed to say, this is not a drill. My heart raced as I gathered my essentials flashlight, radio, batteries, and my dog, Marley, before heading to the bathroom, the safest room in my small, one-story house. As the tornado approached, the wind's howl became a deafening roar, the kind of sound you feel in your bones. The house trembled, windows rattling in their frames before shattering, sending shards of glass flying like ice in a blizzard. I huddled in the bathtub, pulling a mattress over Marley and myself, praying as the world outside seemed to end. Then, suddenly, silence. It was an eerie, otherworldly calm. The eye of the tornado was directly overhead. Venturing out of my makeshift shelter, I stepped into the living room, or what was left of it. The front window was gone, and through the gaping hole I saw the eye's clear sky, a circle of serene blue surrounded by the tumultuous, dark swirls of the storm. It was a moment of peace amid chaos, a haunting beauty in the face of destruction. But this reprieve was brief. The back end of the tornado was approaching, and with it the storm resumed its fury. I dove back under the mattress as the house shook violently once more, the sound of tearing metal and splintering wood filling the air, a cacophony of destruction that drowned out all thoughts but one survival. The tornado passed, leaving behind a silence that was thick with unspoken fears and unsung prayers. Emerging from my battered home, I was met with a scene of devastation. Homes were damaged or destroyed, trees uprooted, and cars tossed about as if they were toys. Neighbors emerged, dazed and bruised, but alive, their faces reflecting a mix of gratitude and shock. In the days that followed, the community came together in a way I had never seen before. We helped clear debris, shared resources, and supported one another through the recovery process. The tornado had taken much from us, but it had also given us something invaluable, a sense of unity and strength. Yet the experience haunted me. Nightmares of that night's terror would wake me, sweating and gasping for air. The sound of wind became a trigger, sending a jolt of fear through me with every gust. I struggled with the decision to stay in Waco, the place I had called home for so long, or to leave it all behind to escape the memories of that day. In the end, I chose to stay, to rebuild not just my home, but my life. The tornado had changed me, teaching me the fragility of life and the strength found in community. It showed me that even in the midst of chaos and destruction, there can be moments of peace and beauty, and that sometimes survival means more than just living through a storm, it means facing the aftermath with courage and the support of those around you. As the days turned into weeks, the physical remnants of the tornado's passage began to fade. Streets were cleared, houses rebuilt, and life in Waco started to find its way back to a new normal. Yet for those of us who lived through it, the scars ran deeper, etched into our memories and our very souls. I found solace in the community around me and shared stories of survival and loss, of close calls and narrow escapes. We were bound by an experience that defied words, a collective understanding that went beyond the spoken language. It was in these moments, sharing meals made from what little we had, helping each other sift through the rubble for memories and keepsakes, that I found the strength to rebuild. But the tornado had left more than just physical destruction in its wake. It had stirred something within the town, a sense of unease that whispered in the winds that followed. 
Strange occurrences began to happen, shadows that moved with no source, voices carried on the breeze with no speaker, and an unsettling feeling of being watched. It was as if the tornado had torn a veil between worlds, leaving us exposed to things unseen, forces beyond our understanding. I first noticed it when Marley, once a vibrant and energetic companion, became withdrawn, his ears constantly twitching at sounds I couldn't hear. He refused to go near certain areas of the rebuilt house, whining and digging his heels in with uncharacteristic stubbornness. Then there were the nights I would wake to find objects moved, doors open that I had closed before bed, and a chilling draft that seemed to snake its way through the house, leaving goosebumps in its wake. The community talked in hushed tones about these experiences, each story adding to a tapestry of unease. Some spoke of seeing loved ones who had perished in the storm, standing at the edge of their beds or watching from the rebuilt streets, their eyes hollow, their presence both comforting and terrifying. Others talked of inexplicable malfunctions with new appliances, lights flickering without cause, and phones ringing with no one on the other end. It was during this time that I met an old woman from the outskirts of town, a recluse who had lived through more storms than most. She spoke of the tornado with a different tone, not of fear, but of respect. Tornadoes are nature's way of reminding us of our place, she said, her eyes reflecting the flicker of candlelight. They carry with them the spirits of the land, and sometimes they don't leave alone. She told me of old rituals, ways to appease the restless spirits and protect the home from their mischievous ways. Skeptical but desperate for peace, I followed her instructions, marking thresholds with salt and hanging wind chimes made of bone and metal to ward off unwanted visitors. Slowly, the strange occurrences began to lessen, the unease that had settled over my home dissipating like morning fog. Yet, the experience changed us, the survivors of the Waco tornado. We became more attuned to the world around us, to the thin lines that separate the known from the unknown. We understood that with every storm, there is a balance to be maintained, a respect to be given to the forces beyond our control. Years have passed since the tornado tore through our lives, but its legacy remains. We gather each year on the anniversary, not just to remember the lives lost and the homes destroyed, but to honor the strength we found in the aftermath, the bonds formed in the face of adversity. We share stories, not just of survival, but of the strange and unexplained, a testament to the mystery that surrounds us. In Waco, the tornado is remembered not just as an event of destruction, but as a turning point, a moment that taught us the value of community, the strength of the human spirit, and the profound mystery that lies at the heart of nature. It's a reminder that in the end we are all at the mercy of forces greater than ourselves, and that sometimes the most we can do is hold on and weather the storm together. Story 18 My fascination with the paranormal had always been a constant in my life, a curiosity sparked by childhood tales and fueled by countless books and documentaries. So when the opportunity arose to join a group of urban explorers venturing into the abandoned Yorktown Memorial Hospital, a site notorious for its haunted reputation, I leapt at the chance. The hospital, closed since the late 1980s, had been the subject of many a ghost story with tales of former patients and staff lingering in the shadows, unable to move on. The day was overcast, the clouds hanging low as if to shroud the hospital in secrecy. Our group gathered at the gates, a mix of thrill-seekers and paranormal investigators, each of us carrying a backpack filled with cameras, voice recorders, and electromagnetic field EMF meters. The air was thick with anticipation, and if I were honest, a touch of fear. The building loomed before us, its once white facade now grayed and peeling, windows broken, an epitome of decay. Crossing the threshold, I felt a sudden shift in the atmosphere. It was as though the air grew denser, heavier, charged with an unseen energy. Our footsteps echoed in the empty halls, the sound unnervingly crisp against the silence. The hospital was a maze of corridors and rooms, each turn revealing scenes of abandonment gurneys littered about, faded walls where paintings once hung, and the pervasive smell of decay. It wasn't long before our equipment began to malfunction. Cameras refused to focus, batteries drained in minutes, and our EMF meters flickered erratically. It was as if the hospital itself was resisting our intrusion, an unseen force meddling with our attempts to document the visit. As we delved deeper into the hospital, the eerie feeling intensified. 
The sound of gurneys moving in empty corridors reached our ears, a chilling reminder of the building's past life. Shadows seemed to dart past doorways, always just out of sight, flitting into the darkness before we could catch a glimpse. I could feel the hair on the back of my neck stand, a primal reaction to the fear that began to take hold. The turning point came when we reached the operating rooms. The air felt charged, almost electric, and the temperature dropped noticeably. One of our group, a skeptic who had laughed off the stories, went pale, his eyes fixed on something only he could see. He stuttered out a warning, pointing to a corner of the room where the shadow seemed deeper, more solid. As we watched, frozen in place, the shape moved, a formless mass that seemed to hover in the air before disappearing. Panic set in then, a collective fear that seized us all. The bravado that had bolstered our spirits at the start of the exploration evaporated, replaced by an overwhelming urge to flee. We turned as one, rushing back through the corridors, no longer concerned with exploration or documentation. Our only thought was escape, to put as much distance between us and the hospital as possible. We emerged into the daylight, gasping for air, the oppressive atmosphere of the hospital lifting as though a weight had been removed from our chests. Glancing back, the building seemed to watch us, its broken windows like eyes that had seen too much. We left in silence, each of us processing the experience in our own way. In the days that followed, I struggled with the experience. Sleep eluded me, my dreams haunted by the shadows and sounds of the hospital. I questioned what we had encountered, torn between rational explanations and the undeniable fear we had all felt. The experience at Yorktown Memorial Hospital had changed me, opening my eyes to the possibility of worlds beyond our understanding, where the past lingers, unable to let go. Yet, despite the fear and the sleepless nights, I found myself drawn to the experience, a part of me eager to explore further, to seek out the stories whispered in the dark corners of the world. The haunted hospital had offered a glimpse into the unknown, a challenge to the boundaries of reality as I knew it. The aftermath of our hasty retreat from Yorktown Memorial Hospital left me with more questions than answers. My mind wrestled with the possibility of the paranormal, trying to rationalize the inexplicable events we experienced. Despite my initial fear, a deeper, more insatiable curiosity took root. I found myself poring over old records and accounts of the hospital, searching for clues that might explain the shadows and sounds that had terrified us so profoundly. The hospital's history was a tapestry of life and death, a place where countless stories had unfolded some of hope and healing, others of despair and darkness. It was as if the very walls were imbued with the emotional remnants of the past, echoes of the myriad souls who had passed through its corridors. Some believed that traumatic events could leave an imprint on the fabric of a place, a theory that seemed all too plausible, given what we had encountered. Driven by a newfound determination, I reached out to other groups and individuals who had dared to explore the hospital. Their stories mirrored ours, tales of inexplicable phenomena, of voices whispering in the dark, and of an oppressive presence that seemed to follow them through the abandoned wards. It was clear that we were not alone in our experiences, that the hospital was a nexus of unexplained activity. The decision to return was not made lightly. The fear of what lay within those decayed walls was a powerful deterrent, but the need for answers, for understanding, was stronger. This time our approach was more methodical, equipped with an array of sophisticated equipment and a resolve to document and verify our experiences. Our return to Yorktown Memorial was under the cloak of night, a time when the veil between worlds is said to be thinnest. The familiar silhouette of the hospital loomed before us, its presence more menacing under the cover of darkness. The air was still, the silence of the surrounding area punctuated only by the occasional sound of wildlife. Entering the building, the oppressive atmosphere enveloped us once more, a tangible reminder of our previous visit. As we made our way through the hospital, our equipment sprang to life, capturing fluctuations in temperature in electromagnetic fields and recording unexplained noises. The sense of being watched was ever-present, a weight on our shoulders that grew heavier with each step. In the operating rooms, where the shadows had moved of their own volition, we set up cameras and voice recorders, hoping to capture evidence of the phenomena we had witnessed. It was in the maternity ward that we encountered the heart of the hospital's haunting. The air was colder here, 
the atmosphere charged with a palpable sense of sadness. Our cameras recorded orbs of light that moved with purpose, and our recorders captured the sound of a baby crying, a sound that had no place in the abandoned ward. It was here, surrounded by the remnants of joy and sorrow, that we felt the most intense connection to the hospital's past. The night passed in a blur of activity, each discovery more astonishing than the last. By the time dawn began to break, painting the sky in hues of pink and gold, we were exhausted but exhilarated. We had come seeking answers and left with undeniable evidence of the paranormal, a testament to the mysteries that lay within the walls of Yorktown Memorial Hospital. In the weeks and months that followed, our evidence sparked debates and discussions within the paranormal community. Skeptics questioned the authenticity of our findings, while believers found validation in our experiences. For me, the return to Yorktown Memorial had been a journey not just into the heart of a haunted hospital, but into the depths of my own beliefs and fears. Story 19 The drive to Corpus Christi had been long and exhausting. It was supposed to be a simple road trip, a way to clear my head after months of non-stop work. But as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and purple, fatigue took over. I wasn't going to make it to my planned destination. The glowing neon sign of a roadside motel promised a night's respite, though its run-down appearance made me hesitate. I decided any bed was better than my car's backseat. The motel was a relic from a bygone era, the kind of place you'd see in a classic road movie, not necessarily as the setting for a pleasant stay. The sign flickered erratically, as if debating whether to fully reveal the establishment's name. I parked my car in the almost empty lot and walked into the dimly lit lobby. The interior didn't offer much improvement over the exterior. The air was musty, carrying a blend of old cigarettes and dampness. Behind the counter, a man who seemed as old as the motel itself gave me a nod. His eyes were tired, his smile forced, as if he'd seen too many travelers pass through to truly care anymore. Room for one, I said trying to keep my voice steady despite the unsettling ambience. Upstairs, end of the hall. Number nine, he grunted, sliding a key across the counter without looking up from his newspaper. The hallway to my room was narrow and dimly lit, each step on the carpet sending up a small puff of dust. I found room nine at the very end, as instructed. The door creaked ominously as I opened it, revealing a small, sparsely furnished room that time had forgotten. A flickering bulb, a bed with dubious sheets, a dresser, and a window with a view of the parking lot. It wasn't much, but exhaustion clouded my judgment. I fell onto the bed without bothering to change and was soon lost in a deep sleep, the kind that envelops you whole, where reality blurs into dreams. But the tranquility was short-lived. Late into the night, a commotion startled me awake. Voices argued heatedly in the room next to mine their words muffled but intense. I lay there heart racing, trying to convince myself it was none of my business. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, silence fell. An eerie, heavy silence that seemed to press against the walls. Lanise gnawed at me, but exhaustion pulled me back into a fitful sleep. Dawn broke with a golden hue, casting long shadows across the room. I rubbed the sleep from my eyes, the events of the night playing back like a distant dream. Curiosity, however, got the better of me. I decided to inquire about the disturbance as I checked out. The lobby was empty save for the same man behind the counter, now nursing a cup of coffee. About last night I began the argument next door. Is everything all right? He paused, coffee midair, then set it down, looking at me with a blend of confusion and curiosity. You heard arguing. From which room? next door to mine. Room 8. I guess my voice trailed off, unsure. He stared at me for a moment longer, then shook his head. Can't be. No one stayed in room 8 for weeks. Place gets few enough guests as is. A chill ran down my spine, but I heard them. Clear as day. Ah, this old place has its stories. Walls whisper old tales, echoes of the past, maybe. Or maybe you just dreamt it he said, a hint of nonchalance in his tone. 
The explanation sat uneasily with me, but I left it at that. The day was too beautiful to dwell on nocturnal mysteries. I thanked the man and walked out into the bright morning sun, the unease slowly receding as I drove away. But the incident lingered in my mind, gnawing at me with unanswered questions. As miles stretched between me and the motel, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to roommate than mere echoes of the past. My curiosity turned into an obsession, drawing me back to Corpus Christi, back to the roadside motel with its flickering sign. I checked in again, this time insisting on roommate. The man behind the counter raised an eyebrow but didn't object. Suit yourself, he said, handing me the key. Roommate was a mirror image of room 9, but stepping inside felt like crossing into another realm. The air was colder, the silence deeper. I placed a recorder on the nightstand, half expecting to capture whispers or cries in the night. But as darkness fell, only the sound of my own breathing filled the room. I awoke to the recorder's static, no voices captured, no proof of the unseen. Yet the feeling of being watched, of not being alone, pressed heavily upon me. I decided to explore the motel, to seek answers from the structure itself. The hallway was quiet, each door hiding its own story. The stairs creaked under my weight as I descended into the lobby. The man behind the counter was nowhere to be seen, leaving me alone with the silence. I ventured outside, the dawn casting long shadows across the lot. The motel seemed to stand at the edge of the world, a keeper of secrets too dark to be shared. As the sun rose, painting the sky in shades of pink and gold, a decision formed in my mind. I would stay another night, in room 9 this time, with the recorder at the ready. Maybe the voices would speak again, maybe the story of room 8 would reveal itself. Or maybe, just maybe, I would find the peace to leave this place behind, its mysteries unsolved but its whispers silenced. With the decision made, I spent the day wandering the town, trying to distract myself from the growing anticipation of the night ahead. Despite the sunlight and the lively streets of Corpus Christi, my thoughts remained anchored to the motel, to the enigma of room 8 and the silence that had followed the night's unrest. It was as if the motel existed in a different dimension, one foot in reality and the other in a realm of unanswered questions and shadows. As evening approached, I found myself back at the motel, the neon sign flickering a hesitant welcome. The lobby was deserted when I entered, the air thick with the same musty smell that had greeted me on my first visit. The key to room 9 lay waiting on the counter, left out for me by the absent caretaker. It seemed he had grown accustomed to my presence, or perhaps he was indifferent to the comings and goings of his guests, each carrying their own reasons for seeking shelter within these walls. I made my way to room 9, the recorder in my hand a tangible link to the world of the living, a witness to whatever might unfold in the hours ahead. The room welcomed me back with its familiar, unchanging appearance. I set up the recorder, positioning it closer to the wall I shared with room 8, hoping to capture any sound, any whisper of the night before. The wait was long and filled with a tense silence. The motel seemed to hold its breath, the usual sounds of the night absent, as if the world beyond my door had ceased to exist. My eyes grew heavy, the effort of listening intently for any disturbance merging with the fatigue that clung to my bones. Eventually, sleep claimed me, a reluctant surrender to the physical demands of my body. I awoke to the sound of static from the recorder, the early morning light seeping through the curtains. For a moment I lay still, listening for any sign of the previous night's voices, but there was nothing. The motel was wrapped in a quiet that felt like a weight upon my chest. I replayed the recording, fast-forwarding through hours of silence, but there was no trace of the arguing voices no echo of the mysterious disturbance that had driven me back to this place. The disappointment was a physical sensation, a mix of relief and unresolved tension. I had come seeking answers, driven by a need to understand, but the motel remained a keeper of secrets, indifferent to my quest. The realization dawned on me that some mysteries are not meant to be unraveled, that some voices are only meant to be heard once, a fleeting connection to the unknown. I checked out of the motel that morning, leaving behind the room key in an unspoken part of myself. The man behind the counter gave me a nod of acknowledgement, his expression unreadable. As I drove away, the motel shrinking in my rearview mirror, 
I felt a sense of closure mixed with an inexplicable sorrow. The voices of Room 8 had fallen silent, their story untold, but their presence had changed something within me, a subtle shift in the way I perceived the world around me. The road stretched out before me, leading back to the familiarity of my life, but the experience at the roadside motel in Corpus Christi lingered in my thoughts. It was a reminder of the unseen forces that brush against our existence, leaving their mark in ways we may never fully understand. The motel, with its flickering neon sign and its whispered secrets, had become a part of my journey, a chapter in my life marked by the unexplainable and the unseen. As I merged back onto the highway, the sun climbed higher in the sky, casting a warm glow over the landscape. I felt a sense of release, a letting go of the need to solve every mystery, to understand every shadow. The voices of Room 8, whether a trick of the mind or a brush with the supernatural, had given me a story to carry, a tale of a night spent at the edge of understanding, where the past and present blurred into a single, haunting melody. Story 20 The air on Padre Island was thick with the salty tang of the sea, a constant reminder of the vast, unexplored depths just beyond the reach of our campfire's light. My friend Jamie and I had set up our tents on a secluded part of the island, far from the usual tourist spots. It was supposed to be an adventure, a break from the monotony of our daily lives. Little did we know, it would turn into a nightmare. We spent the day swimming and exploring the island, marveling at the isolation and untouched beauty of our surroundings. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and purple, we lit a campfire and settled in for the night. The sound of the waves crashing against the shore was a soothing backdrop to our conversation, which meandered from the mundane to the philosophical. It was the perfect evening until Jamie mentioned taking a midnight walk along the beach. I remember laughing it off at first. Are you serious? It's pitch black out there, I said, my eyes straining against the darkness beyond our campfire's glow. There's a full moon tonight. It's bright enough. Come on, it'll be an adventure, Jamie insisted, a spark of excitement in their eyes that I hadn't seen in a long time. Despite my hesitations, I couldn't dampen their spirit. Okay, but don't wander off too far. The tide can be tricky at night, I cautioned, my words carrying an edge of concern. With a nod and a smile, Jamie set off into the night, their figure quickly swallowed by the darkness. I watched until I could no longer distinguish their silhouette against the moonlit beach then turned my attention back to the fire, poking at the embers and losing myself in thought. Time seemed to stretch and bend around me. What I thought were mere minutes turned out to be hours. A sudden chill ran down my spine as I realized Jamie hadn't returned. Panic set in as I called out their name, my voice swallowed by the vast emptiness of the island. Grabbing a flashlight, I ventured into the darkness, retracing the path I imagined Jamie might have taken. The beach was a different world under the moon's pale light, shadows dancing and twisting into menacing shapes. I called out again, desperation creeping into my voice, but the only answer was the relentless sound of the waves. My heart raced as I scoured the beach, the dunes, even the tree line, but Jamie was nowhere to be found. As dawn broke, painting the sky in hues of pink and gold, I was forced to accept the unthinkable. Jamie had vanished without a trace. I contacted the authorities, a mixture of hope and dread nodding in my stomach. The search was extensive, covering the island and the surrounding waters, but it was as if Jamie had been erased from existence. The police were sympathetic but not surprised. It happens more often than you'd think one officer told me, a somber look in their eyes. People get swept away by the sea, or dot 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 well, there are stories about Padre Island, legends of something darker lurking here. With Jamie's disappearance, a shadow hung over Padre Island, turning its natural beauty into something sinister. The police had hinted at legends, tales of the island that locals whispered about, but never fully acknowledged. Driven by a desperate need to understand, I began to dig deeper, questioning anyone who would talk to me about the island's darker secrets. I learned of old stories passed down through generations, speaking of spirits that wandered the beach of entities that guarded the island against intruders. Some spoke of a hidden curse placed by ancient inhabitants to protect sacred grounds. 
Others mentioned sightings of ghostly figures along the shore, vanishing into thin air when approached. Each story was different, yet they all shared a core of unsettling truth. Padre Island was a place of mystery, where the line between the natural and the supernatural seemed blurred. The days turned into weeks, and still there was no sign of Jamie. The search parties had long since disbanded, leaving me to wander the island alone, haunted by the absence of my friend. The locals who once welcomed me with open arms now looked upon me with pity, their eyes filled with unspoken warnings to leave the island's secrets buried. But I couldn't leave, not without Jamie. My search led me to the island's more secluded areas, places where the sand seemed untouched by human footsteps and the air held a palpable tension. It was on one such evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon and the world was bathed in twilight, that I saw something that chilled me to the core. Standing at the edge of the beach, where the waves gently lapped at the sand, was a figure. It was too far to discern features, but its presence was unmistakable. I called out, my voice shaky with a mix of fear and hope, but the figure remained motionless. As I approached, it began to fade, like mist being swallowed by the night, until it was gone entirely. In its place, I found something that brought me to my knees, Jamie's necklace, lying in the sand, the chain tangled amongst the seaweed. The realization hit me like a wave. Jamie wasn't coming back. Whether taken by the sea or by something beyond my understanding, they were gone. My grief was overwhelming, a physical weight that threatened to drag me down. I understood then why the island held so many stories, why the locals spoke in hushed tones about the things that lurked in the shadows. Padre Island was a place of beauty, but it was also a place of loss. In the weeks that followed, I left the island carrying with me the heavy burden of unanswered questions. The authorities eventually closed Jamie's case, another unsolved mystery in a place that seemed to have too many. But for me, the search never truly ended. I find myself drawn to stories of the unexplained, always searching for answers in the hope that one day I might understand what happened to Jamie on that fateful night. Story 21 the vastness of West Texas can't be overstated, it's a landscape that swallows you whole, leaving you feeling like a mere speck under the expansive sky. The ranch I was watching over sprawled over thousands of acres, a sea of grass and dirt that seemed to stretch into infinity. The owners, an older couple who had entrusted me with their livelihood while they visited family out of state, had warned me about the isolation. It can get to you, they said, with a knowing look that I didn't fully understand until that evening. The day had been blisteringly hot, the kind of heat that shimmers on the horizon and makes everything look like a mirage. As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in shades of orange and purple, a cool breeze swept across the ranch, a welcome relief after the day's heat. It was then that I noticed the cattle. They were restless, moving in a way that was anything but normal. Cattle have a certain predictability to them, a calmness that comes with routine, but not tonight. Tonight, they were agitated, their mooing more like cries of distress. I grabbed my flashlight and rifle, the weight of the latter a cold comfort. The nearest neighbor was miles away, and the owners had left me with stern instructions to protect the ranch at all costs. As I approached the fence line, the reason for the cattle's distress became glaringly obvious. A section of the fence had been cut, clean and deliberate. The cut was fresh, the metal of the wire still shining under the flashlight's beam. Panic set in as I followed the tracks leading away into the darkness. The isolation of the ranch, once a peaceful solitude, now felt suffocating. Every rustle of the grass, every snap of a twig underfoot, sent my heart racing. The darkness seemed to close in around me, thick and oppressive. I was acutely aware of how alone I was, how vulnerable. The tracks were odd, too large to be any animal I was familiar with, and they seemed to have a purposeful stride, leading away from the ranch towards the denser parts of the property. After what felt like hours but was likely only minutes, I stopped. The realization hit me like a physical blow. We weren't alone out here. The thought sent a shiver down my spine, the kind of primal fear that you can't shake off. I wasn't just protecting cattle, I was protecting myself from something unknown, something that had the audacity to invade this isolated sanctuary. I made my way back to the ranch house, my steps quick and purposeful. Every shadow seemed to move, every noise a potential threat. 
I reinforced the doors and windows, turning the house into a fortress. Then, I waited. The night stretched on, a test of endurance. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, of being hunted. The vastness of the ranch, once a thing of beauty, now felt like a curse. There was nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. The isolation was no longer peaceful, it was a danger all its own. As dawn broke, casting a pale light over the ranch, I ventured out again. With the first light of dawn casting long shadows across the landscape, the ranch transformed once more. The darkness that had seemed so oppressive now retreated, revealing the familiar contours of the land. Yet, the events of the night had irrevocably changed my perception of this place. The cut fence and the mysterious tracks were stark reminders of the night's reality. I couldn't shake off the feeling of vulnerability, the unsettling knowledge that the vastness around me offered no real protection. I set about repairing the fence with a sense of urgency, every noise making me tense. The normal sounds of the ranch, once comforting, now carried an undercurrent of threat. Despite my efforts to focus on the task at hand, my mind raced, piecing together what little I knew. The precision of the cut fence suggested human involvement, but the size and pattern of the tracks left me with more questions than answers. As the day wore on, the heat returned, mirroring my growing frustration and fear. I found myself constantly scanning the horizon, half expecting to see a figure emerge from the heat haze. The isolation of the ranch, once its greatest allure, now felt like a trap. With the owners away and the nearest neighbor miles distant, I was acutely aware of how alone I was. Determined to understand what I was up against, I decided to follow the tracks further than I had the night before. Armed with my rifle and a determination born of desperation, I traced the path taken by the intruder. The tracks led me to a part of the ranch I seldom visited, a wilder section where the grass grew tall and the trees clustered more closely together. It was a part of the ranch that felt untouched, ancient even. The tracks eventually led to a small clearing, where the ground was disturbed. It looked like some kind of struggle had taken place, the dirt upturned and the grass flattened in wide swathes. At the center of the clearing I found a piece of fabric, torn and stained with something dark. It was a chilling discovery, one that confirmed my worst fears. Something violent had happened here. As I stood in the clearing, the silence was shattered by a sound that made my blood run cold a low, guttural growl that seemed to come from all directions. I spun around rifle at the ready, but saw nothing. The sound seemed to mock me, a reminder that I was not the hunter but the hunted. The realization was paralyzing, a fear so profound it rooted me to the spot. It was then that I saw it, a fleeting glimpse of something moving at the edge of the clearing, too large to be a man, too deliberate to be an animal. I took aim, but it vanished as quickly as it had appeared, leaving me with a sense of dread that was almost suffocating. I was dealing with something I couldn't understand, something that defied explanation. I returned to the ranch house with more questions than answers, the day's discoveries weighing heavily on me. The isolation of the ranch, once a haven, now felt like a besieged fortress. I knew I couldn't face whatever was out there alone. I needed help, but the very nature of what I was facing made it impossible to explain. Who would believe me? The following days were a blur of preparation and vigilance. I fortified the ranch as best I could, all the while feeling the gaze of unseen eyes upon me. The nights were the hardest, each sound a potential threat, each moment stretched thin with tension. I was caught in a nightmare, isolated in a vast wilderness with something inexplicable and malevolent. As I write this, I'm still watching over the ranch the owners do back in a few days. The cut fence has been mended, the cattle calmed, but the sense of unease remains. I've seen no further sign of the intruder, no more tracks leading into the darkness. Yet the feeling of being watched has not abated. I can't shake the feeling that whatever made those tracks is still out there biding its time waiting. The vast open spaces of West Texas, once a symbol of freedom, now feel like a vast ocean in which I'm adrift, vulnerable and alone. Story 22 Venturing into the ghost town of Terlingua had always been on my bucket list. The town, now a shell of its past, whispered tales of a bustling life during the mercury mining boom of the early 1900s. The remnants of civilization, 
eroded by time and weather, held a magnetic allure for someone like me, who thrived on exploring places steeped in history and mystery. I arrived as the sun began its descent, painting the sky in hues of orange and purple. The air carried a certain chill, unusual for a desert evening, wrapping around me like a cold embrace. My footsteps echoed through the empty streets, kicking up clouds of dust that seemed to have remained undisturbed for ages. Terlingua's ghostly silence was punctuated only by the occasional creak of metal and the distant howl of the wind. It was as if the town itself was observing me, an unwelcome intruder in its domain. Drawn by an inexplicable urge, I found myself veering off the main path towards the remnants of the Chiso's mining company. The entrance to one of the old mines, hidden behind a veil of overgrown bushes and debris, beckoned me. Against my better judgment, fueled by curiosity and a hint of bravado, I pushed past the barriers of reason and made my way into the darkness. The air inside the mine was cool and still, a stark contrast to the desert heat outside. My flashlight pierced through the darkness, revealing tunnels that branched off in every direction, a labyrinth of choices. The walls, damp and cold to the touch, bore the scars of pickaxes and dynamite. It was as if I had stepped into a different world, one that was frozen in time, waiting to be discovered. But as I ventured deeper, the comforting beam of my flashlight began to flicker, casting erratic shadows that danced along the walls. An unsettling feeling crept over me, a sense of being watched from the shadows. I told myself it was just my imagination, the result of being in such a place at such a time. Yet the feeling persisted, growing stronger with each step I took. And then, without warning, the entrance collapsed. A deafening roar filled the mine as rocks and debris sealed me inside, plunging me into pitch darkness. Panic surged through me, a primal fear of being trapped, of being buried alive. My flashlight, now my only source of light, flickered feebly before dying out, leaving me in total darkness. The real horror was not the darkness, but the silence. The kind of silence that is loud, oppressive, and all-consuming. It was the silence of the grave, of a world devoid of life and light. I found myself waiting, waiting for something to happen, for rescue or for death. Time lost all meaning and the dark minutes felt like hours, and hours felt like days. As I sat there, trapped and alone, the silence began to fill with sounds. At first it was just the subtle shifting of the earth, the settling of rocks. But soon, whispers filled the air, voices that seemed to come from the very walls of the mine. They spoke in hushed tones, a language I couldn't understand, yet their message was clear. They were the voices of those who had come before me, miners who had toiled in the darkness, only to find their final resting place within these very walls. Their whispers grew louder, more insistent, as if urging me to listen, to understand. I tried to block them out, to convince myself it was just my mind playing tricks on me, the product of fear and isolation. But the voices persisted, weaving tales of sorrow, of longing, and of warnings unheeded. In the depth of despair, a sliver of hope flickered. The idea of giving up never crossed my mind survival was the only option. Drawing on every ab strength and determination, I began to explore my darkened prison, hands outstretched, feeling my way through the oppressive blackness. Each step was a battle against fear, against the voices that sought to drag me into the abyss. I stumbled upon remnants of the past, tools left behind by miners long gone, their presence a testament to the life that once thrived within these tunnels. It was these relics that kept me going, a connection to the world outside, to a time when the mine was alive with the sound of work and laughter. The days passed in a blur of darkness and solitude. My resolve hardened with each passing moment, each whisper of the past that filled the silence. I refused to become another voice in the dark, another tale of warning for those who dared to tread the same path. And then, when all seemed lost, a faint glimmer of light pierced the darkness. It was distant and elusive but it was there a beacon of hope in a sea of despair. With renewed vigor, I pushed towards the light, the voices of the past urging me on, a chorus of encouragement and caution. The journey towards the light was fraught with challenges, with obstacles that tested every fiber of my being. But with each step, the light grew brighter, more inviting, a promise of freedom and redemption. 
and when I finally emerged from the darkness, battered and weary but alive, I realized that the mind had changed me. It had shown me the depths of my own strength and resilience, and the power of the human spirit to overcome even the most insurmountable odds. Terlingua's ghost town and its forgotten mine had given me a story to tell, a tale of survival against all odds, but more than that, it had given me a newfound appreciation for life, for the light that awaits at the end of the darkest tunnel. As I left Terlingua behind, the sun setting once again on the desert horizon, I knew that part of me would always remain in that mine, a witness to the whispers of the past. And though I would never return, the ghost town of Terlingua and its hidden depths would forever haunt my memories, a reminder of the thin line between life and death, light and darkness. Emerging from the mine felt like a rebirth. The air outside, though still carrying the evening's chill, filled my lungs with a sweet relief I thought I'd never experience again. My eyes, accustomed to the unrelenting darkness, blinked against the dimming light of dusk. The silhouette of Terlingua stretched before me, a stark reminder of the fine line between past and present, life and eternity. In the days that followed, my story spread through the small community living on the fringes of the ghost town. They listened with a mix of skepticism and awe, their eyes reflecting the flickering flames of the campfire around which we sat. They spoke of the mine as a place touched by something beyond our understanding, a place where the veil between worlds was thin. Some nodded knowingly, their faces etched with the lines of unspoken experiences, while others dismissed it as the hallucinations of a mind pushed to the brink. But one thing was unanimous among them, no one had expected me to come out alive. The mine, they said, had claimed many lives in the past, miners whose spirits were said to still roam its tunnels, forever trapped in their moment of demise. My survival was a miracle, or perhaps a warning. The old-timers warned me to heed the lessons learned within those dark confines, to respect the boundary between the living and the dead. The experience left me with an insatiable curiosity and an unquenchable thirst for answers. I spent weeks poring over old newspapers and records, talking to historians and the descendants of miners. I learned of the tragedies that had befallen the town, of the dreams that had turned to dust along with its fortunes. Each story, each piece of history, added layers to the mystery of Terlingua and its mine. I couldn't shake the feeling that the voices in the mine had been trying to communicate something vital, a message that was lost on me in the panic and fear of the moment. They were more than just echoes of the past, they felt like sentient beings, aware of my presence, desperate to be heard. I wondered if they had been warning me, guiding me, or perhaps seeking release from their eternal bondage. Determined to find answers, I ventured into other abandoned places, other ghost towns that dotted the landscape of the American Southwest. Each place had its own stories, its own whispers in the dark. But none were quite like Terlingua. None had the same palpable sense of time suspended, of a story frozen mid-telling. Months turned into years, and my journey took me across continents, into the heart of ancient ruins and forgotten places. I became a collector of tales, a chronicler of the shadows that dwell in the corners of our world. But no matter where I went, the memory of Terlingua and its mind followed me, a constant reminder of the mystery that had ignited my quest. In the end, I returned to Terlingua, drawn back by the unseen forces that had marked my soul. The town welcomed me back with its eerie silence, unchanged and timeless. As I stood at the sealed entrance of the mine, I felt a profound connection to the voices that had reached out to me from the darkness. I realized then that their message was not one of warning or guidance, but of shared humanity. They had not been reaching out to me from the past, they were reaching out to me from the depths of human experience, a reminder of our collective journey through the light and dark of existence. The ghost town of Terlingua taught me that the most profound horrors and beauties lie not in the supernatural but in the human heart and spirit. Our stories, whether whispered in the dark or shouted in the light, are threads in the fabric of the human experience, connecting us across time and space. Story 23 The abandoned Yorktown Memorial Hospital had always loomed large in the lore of urban explorers. Known for its chilling history and tales of hauntings, it sat like a dormant beast on the outskirts of town, its decayed facade reminder of the past. The hospital, once a bustling center of healing, 
had become a sanctuary for the lost souls left behind. Its reputation was a mix of whispered tales and eerie photographs, a beacon for thrill-seekers and ghost hunters alike. I, too, was drawn to it, a moth to the flame of its dark allure. The day I ventured into Yorktown Memorial, the sky was overcast, casting a pall over the world that mirrored the heaviness in my heart. The air was still, as if nature itself held its breath in anticipation of what was to come. As I stepped through the gaping maw of the main entrance, a shiver ran down my spine, a primal warning that went unheeded. The darkness within seemed alive, pulsating with unseen energy. Armed with a flashlight and a camera, I began to navigate the hospital's corridors. Each room I entered was a capsule of despair, frozen in time. The decayed walls, peeling paint, and shattered windows told stories of countless souls who had passed through, leaving behind echoes of their pain and fear. I could almost hear the distant cries of the patients, the weary footsteps of the nurses, and the somber declarations of the doctors. It was as though the hospital was a living entity, its veins running deep with the memories of the past. The further I delved into the bowels of the hospital, the heavier the air became, thick with the scent of mold and decay. It was in the bowels of the hospital that I found the chapel, a room untouched by vandals, its stained glass windows casting multicolored shadows across the dust-covered pews. It was a pocket of sanctity amidst the chaos, a place that, despite its beauty, sent chills down my spine. There was a palpable sense of being watched, of eyes boring into my back from the shadows. As daylight began to fade, I decided it was time to leave, my heart heavy with the stories I had witnessed. But as I attempted to retrace my steps, a creeping realization dawned on me I was lost. Corridors that once seemed familiar now twisted and turned in impossible ways, doors leading to rooms I had never seen. It was as if the hospital had come alive, its layout rearranging itself around me in a macabre dance. Panic began to set in, a cold, gripping fear that clawed at my mind. I wandered the shifting hallways, my flashlight beam a feeble attempt to pierce the overwhelming darkness. The hospital seemed to mock my efforts, its walls whispering secrets in a language I couldn't understand. Time became a meaningless concept, measured only by the beat of my heart and the rapid pace of my breathing. In my wanderings, I stumbled upon the records room, a veritable tomb of forgotten lives. Rows upon rows of filing cabinets filled the space, each drawer a testament to a soul who had once walked these halls. Dust motes danced in the beam of my flashlight, a silent ballet of the lost. It was here, amidst the decaying records of the dead, that I felt an overwhelming sense of despair wash over me, a tidal wave of sorrow that threatened to drag me under. The hospital's secrets were legion, each room a chapter in a book written in blood and tears. The operating rooms, with their rusted instruments and stained tables, spoke of surgeries performed in desperation, of lives hanging in the balance. The maternity ward, with its cribs lined up like coffins, whispered tales of joy and heartbreak, of beginnings and endings intertwined. As the night deepened, the hospital's malevolent presence grew stronger, its energy suffocating. Shadows moved of their own accord, shapes flickering at the edge of my vision, always just out of sight. The air was filled with the sound of whispers, voices that were neither male nor female, speaking in urgent tones. They seemed to be guiding me, leading me deeper into the labyrinth. And then, I heard it a cry, distant and forlorn, echoing through the corridors. It was the sound of anguish, a soul crying out in eternal torment. The voice led me to the psychiatric ward, a place where the veil between sanity and madness was at its thinnest. The rooms here were smaller, the windows barred, each one a prison cell for a mind lost to the shadows. It was in the psychiatric ward that I encountered her, the source of the cry. A spectral figure, her form barely visible in the dim light, her features blurred as if seen through water. She was a patient, trapped in a loop of her own despair, her eyes hollow pools of sorrow. Her presence filled the room with a palpable sadness, a grief so profound it was almost tangible. I realized then that I was not alone in my wanderings. The hospital was inhabited by the souls of those who had passed through its doors, each one bound to the place of their suffering. They were the lost, the forgotten, 
the abandoned each with their own tale of woe, forever etched into the fabric of the building. As dawn approached, the hospital began to release its grip on me, the corridors slowly returning to their original layout. The exit appeared before me as if by magic, the outside world a blur of color and light after the darkness of the night. Stepping out into the cool morning air, I took a deep breath, the scent of freedom sweet and intoxicating. The experience at Yorktown Memorial Hospital had changed me, leaving its mark on my soul. I had walked the halls of the dead, listened to their whispers, and witnessed their sorrow. The hospital was more than just a building, it was a repository of pain, a monument to the fragility of life and the certainty of death. As I drove away, the hospital receded in my rearview mirror, a silent sentinel watching over the memories of those who could not leave. Its secrets were mine now, a burden I would carry with me forever. The haunting of Yorktown Memorial Hospital was not just a tale of ghosts and specters, it was a reminder of the human capacity for suffering and the eternal quest for redemption in the face of despair. Emerging from the depths of Yorktown Memorial Hospital, the early morning light felt alien, almost intrusive, after the unending darkness within. My body moved mechanically towards my car, but my mind lingered on the threshold between the worlds I had just traversed. The sun's rays did little to warm the chill that had settled deep in my bones, a constant reminder of the night's ordeal. The drive home was a blur, the landscape passing by unregistered. My thoughts were ensnared in the hospital's grip, replaying the events, questioning the reality of what I had experienced. The rational part of my brain sought logical explanations, while another, more primal part knew the truth of the darkness I had touched. Once home, the confines of my familiar space felt foreign, as if I had left behind a part of myself in the hospital's maw. Sleep was elusive, chased away by shadows that danced at the edge of my perception, whispers that filled the silence of my room. It was clear that Yorktown Memorial had imprinted itself upon me, its specters unwilling to remain confined within its walls. In the days that followed, I attempted to return to my normal routine, but the fabric of my reality had been irrevocably altered. The camera I had carried with me, now sitting untouched on my desk, was a tangible link to the nightmare I had lived. It held within it the visual evidence of my journey, yet I found myself unable to face whatever truths its images might reveal. Compelled by a force I couldn't understand, I eventually mustered the courage to review the photographs. Each image was a window back into the darkness, the desolation of the rooms, the decayed hallways, and most unnervingly, the shadows that seemed to possess form and intent. Among them, a picture of the chapel stood out, its stained glass windows vibrant against the gloom, an ethereal figure visible amidst the pews. It was her, the spectral woman from the psychiatric ward, her sorrow captured in a single haunting frame. This visual confirmation shattered any lingering denial, cementing my experience in the realm of the undeniable. Yorktown Memorial had revealed to me the thin veil that separates the living from the lost, a boundary I had unwittingly crossed. The hospital, with its legion of trapped souls, had chosen me as a witness to their eternal confinement, a bearer of their stories to the world of the living. Driven by a newfound purpose, I began to research the history of Yorktown Memorial, uncovering tales of tragedy, neglect, and the boundless capacity for human suffering. Each story was a piece of the puzzle, providing context to the whispers, cries, and apparitions that had haunted my visit. My nights were consumed by writing, a desperate attempt to document and share the stories of those who could no longer speak for themselves. The hospital's influence extended beyond the confines of its walls, reaching out through me to touch the world. Reports of my experience and the photographs I shared sparked interest and debate, drawing others to explore the mysteries of Yorktown Memorial. But with each new visitor, the hospital seemed to tighten its grip, claiming more souls for its spectral collection. It became clear that my journey had not been a solitary one, rather, it was part of a larger, more sinister narrative crafted by the hospital itself. Story 25 The Big Thicket was a place of ancient whispers and untold stories, a dense maze of foliage where the line between the known and the unknown blurred. I had always been drawn to the mysteries of nature, the untamed wilds that promised adventure and discovery. 
It was this insatiable curiosity that led me to embark on a solo hike through the heart of the thicket, armed with nothing but my backpack, a map, and a naive sense of invincibility. The day began with promise, the sun filtering through the canopy in golden beams, illuminating the path ahead. The air was filled with the sounds of the forest birds chirping, leaves rustling, and the distant murmur of a stream. It was peaceful, serene, yet as the hours passed and I ventured deeper into the wilderness, an unsettling feeling took root within me. I couldn't shake the sensation of being watched. At first I dismissed it as paranoia, a trick of the mind in the isolation of the woods. But the feeling persisted, growing stronger with each step, until I was glancing over my shoulder with every rustle of the leaves, every snap of a twig. I tried to convince myself it was just the wildlife, the inhabitants of the thicket keeping a curious eye on an intruder in their midst. Yet the sense of unease continued to grow, a tight knot in my stomach that refused to unravel. It was in this state of heightened alertness that I stumbled upon the backpack half buried under a layer of leaves and debris. It looked as though it had been there for years. Forgotten by time, the fabric faded and worn by the elements. Driven by a mix of curiosity and concern, I knelt down and carefully excavated the backpack from its leafy tomb. The zipper was stiff with rust, but after a bit of effort, it yielded, revealing its contents to the light of day for the first time in who knows how long. Among the expected items, a water bottle, a flashlight, a moldy piece of what I assumed was once food was a journal. The cover was weathered, the pages swollen from exposure to moisture, but it was intact. I opened it to the first page where a name was written in a neat, steady hand, Daniel Thompson, as I flipped through the entries, Daniel's story began to unfold. The journal started as a typical account of a hiking adventure, filled with descriptions of the landscape, the challenges of the trail, and the joy of solitude. But as I read on, the tone shifted. The entries became less about the hike and more about a sense of being followed, of seeing shadows flit between the trees, of hearing whispers carried on the wind. Daniel's writing grew increasingly erratic, his thoughts disjointed and filled with a palpable sense of fear. He spoke of losing time, of waking up miles from where he last remembered being, with no recollection of how he got there. The final entry was dated two years ago, almost to the day. It ended abruptly, mid-sentence, as if Daniel had been suddenly interrupted or taken. With trepidation, I opened the door a crack, the cold, moist air of the night brushing against my skin. The corridor was desolate, an eerie silence enveloping the space where I expected to find a visitor, an explanation for the persistent knocking. I stepped out, my bare feet pressing against the cold, tiled floor, my gaze darting up and down the hallway, searching for any sign of life, any clue to the mystery unfolding. But there was nothing, only the soft whir of the air conditioning unit and the distant sound of the sea churning in the storm. I retreated back into my room, locking the door behind me, a sense of unease settling deep within my bones. The knocks didn't return that night, but sleep eluded me, my mind racing with questions that had no answers. Who was EM? What connection did they have to the piece of wreckage? And who or what was knocking at my door? The next morning, the storm had passed, leaving a clear blue sky and a calm sea in its wake. The air felt different, as if the previous night's events had been swept away with the storm. But the questions remained, nagging at the back of my mind. I decided to visit the local library, hoping to find some historical records that might shed light on the wreckage and the mysterious initials. The librarian, an elderly woman with a wealth of knowledge about Galveston's history, listened intently to my story. Her eyes widened when I showed her the photos of the wreckage and the initials, EM. She murmured, that could be Edward McKendrick. He was a shipbuilder here in the late 1800s. Lost at sea during a storm, his body was never recovered. There were rumors, of course, ghost stories and tales of a cursed ship that would return to haunt the island. A chill ran down my spine as she spoke. Could it be that I had stumbled upon a piece of this cursed ship was I now entangled in its ghostly legacy? Determined to learn more, I thanked the librarian and set out to visit the site of the old shipyard, now nothing more than a historical marker near the edge of the beach. As the day wore on, the sense of being watched returned more oppressive than before. 
It felt as if eyes were following my every move, hidden in the shadows, just out of sight. The sound of knocking haunted me, a constant reminder of the night before. I tried to dismiss it as the product of my stressed mind, but the feeling persisted, growing stronger as dusk approached. By the time I returned to my hotel room, the sensation of dread was overwhelming. I double-checked the locks on the door and windows, an irrational part of me fearing that whatever had knocked the previous night would return. My research had yielded more questions than answers, and the connection between Edward McKendrick, the piece of wreckage, and the knocking remained a mystery. That night, as I lay in bed, the knocking resumed. This time, however, it was accompanied by a voice, a whisper so faint I thought I imagined it. Help me, it pleaded, a note of desperation in its tone. The voice was barely audible over the sound of the waves, but it was unmistakable. It was coming from outside beyond the door, calling out to me. Driven by a mix of fear and determination, I approached the door. The knocking grew more frantic, the voice louder, more urgent. Please help me, it repeated, a plea that tugged at my heartstrings, compelling me to act. I unlocked the door and swung it open, bracing myself for what I might find. But there was nothing. The hallway was empty, the voice silenced, the knocking stopped. Confused and frightened, I stepped into the corridor, my eyes searching the shadows, and then I saw it, a faint glow emanating from the end of the hallway. It beckoned me, a beacon in the darkness, guiding me forward. I followed the light, drawn to it as if in a trance. It led me to the beach, where the moon cast a silver path across the water. There, at the water's edge, stood a figure, ethereal and translucent, its form shimmering in the moonlight. Edward McKendrick, the ghost of the shipbuilder, his expression one of sorrow and longing. I've been trapped here, bound to this island by my unfinished business, he spoke, his voice echoing in the still night air. The wreckage you found was part of my ship, the one that doomed me to this fate. I've been knocking, seeking someone to help me find peace. Moved by his story, I asked what I could do to help. He told me of a locket, lost in the storm that claimed his life a locket that held the key to his release. If I could find it and return it to the sea, he would be freed from his earthly bonds. The search for the locket was long and arduous, taking me through the archives, into the heart of the storm's devastation, and deep into the mysteries of Galveston Island. Along the way, I encountered more signs of Edward's presence, each one guiding me closer to the locket. And when at last I found it, a simple gold locket containing a portrait of a woman, Edward's beloved, I knew what I had to do. Under the light of a full moon, I returned to the beach, the locket clutched tightly in my hand. With a prayer for Edward's peace, I cast it into the sea, watching as the waves carried it away. The air shimmered, and Edward's form appeared one last time, a smile of gratitude on his lips before he faded away, released at last from his earthly torment, 